Good evening and welcome. This is the July 25th, 2022 meeting of your Menlo Park Planning Commission. We're glad you've decided to join us this evening. Established by state law, our Planning Commission is composed of seven volunteer voting age residents of Menlo Park appointed to four year terms by the city council. Our Planning Commission is not a policy setting body, that's the city council. We are a policy implementing body and we also make recommendations to the city council. We review development proposals on public and private lands for compliance with our city's general plan and zoning ordinance. These can be found on our city website. We also review all development proposals requiring a use permit, architectural control, variance, minor subdivision, and environmental review associated with these projects. The commission is the final decision-making body for these applications and less appeal to the city council. The commission also serves as a recommending body to the city council for major subdivisions, rezonings, conditional development permits, zoning ordinance amendments, general plan amendments, and the environmental reviews and below market rate housing agreements associated with those projects. We work in close partnership and greatly rely on the staff of our city's planning division, which is responsible for coordinating the enforcement of the city's zoning ordinance and related policies concerning applications for residential, commercial, and industrial development projects. If this is your first time joining a planning commission meeting this evening, we are very glad you are here and we encourage your active participation, whether you are an applicant or interested member of the public. I'll turn now to associate planner Matt Pruder to explain how members of the public can participate during this evening's proceedings. Mr. Pruder. Thank you, Chair DeCardi. Good evening, everyone. Um, regarding the procedures of communicating for this evening's meeting, the planning commissioners will have their webcams on for the duration of tonight's meeting. For those presenting on an item on tonight's agenda, we ask that you kindly turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your item. A member of staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if you are displaying a presentation. We then kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the chair. During the public comment period, members of the public will, excuse me, will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon on your uh, Zoom interface, upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those calling in by phone for tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keypad to notify staff that you have a comment. For any members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with another commenter during this meeting, please inform staff at the start of your public comment and staff will ensure that the other commenter speaks after you have finished your comment. I would also like to additionally add that we uh, will as staff be keeping track of the three minute comment period. Uh, myself, I will be letting folks know that they have three minutes. I will be keeping track of the timer, which we will not be able to display visually on tonight's interface. And so I will let folks know and remind uh, members of the public when we return to public comment. And with that said, I hand it back to you, Chair DeCarty. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Pruder. Uh, with uh, that taken care of, let's turn to roll call. Um, I'll uh, turn to each of the commissioners and ask you to verbally um, acknowledge your presence here tonight. I'll try alphabetical order, which I believe uh, starts with Commissioner Barnes. Good evening, present. Commissioner Doe. I'm present. Vice Chair Harris. Everyone, present. Commissioner Riggs. I'm present. Commissioner Thomas. Good evening, I'm present. Uh, and I am Chris Ticardi. My pronouns are he, him, and I will be our chair this evening. We believe Commissioner Tate uh, is absent. Uh, so with roll call done, let's turn to reports and announcements. Uh, and I'll look to acting principal planner for our city, Corinna Sandmeyer, for those. Ms. Sandmeyer, good evening. Good evening, uh, Chair Ticardi and commissioners. Um, the one update, the plan, uh, the City Council will be meeting tomorrow on the um, vesting tentative map extension for 706 Santa Cruz. And uh, that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Any immediate questions from the commission at this point this evening? All right, seeing none, uh, and uh, noting that we do not have a consent calendar for approval this evening, 
we will now move on. Oh, pardon me. Let's go the other direction um, for public comment. Um, under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda and items listed under consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. So this is our first public comment period tonight. And again, it is for items that are not on the agenda later this evening. Mr. Perter. Thank you again, Chair DeCarty and members of the Planning Commission and members of the public at this time. Uh, this is the opportunity for public comment. And uh, again, if anyone would like to uh, raise their hand, they can press the hand icon and we will allow you to have uh, abilities to speak for public comment at this time. And I have two hands raised uh, so we can begin that process. Um, the first one in the order I've seen is a person named Roxy. Uh, if you could please state your name once I've unmuted you and your jurisdiction. Um, and also keep in mind, you have three minutes to speak the moment you start speaking. I will remind uh, members of the public when they have 30 seconds left and when the time has elapsed as well. Uh, but at this time, uh, when you're ready, Roxy, uh, please begin to speak. Uh, you're able to speak at this time. Unmute. Can you hear me now? The, my name is Roxanne Roropoff. I live at 885 Sherman Avenue in Menlo Park. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the jurisdiction, which I forgot, but it's Ray Mueller's jurisdiction. But anyway, I'm calling because today I looked at the plans of a project that's going taking place next door to me. Um, it's 905. It's being built. A big house is being built by Thomas uh, James Holmes. And the reason I'm concerned about the big house is and our backyard is a beautiful valley oak tree. It's a heritage tree. It's very large. It's a large part of its canopy and critical root zone is in the backyard of this 905 property. Um, when the property was being developed, I worked with the Thomas James Holmes people to modify the um, plans and um, to to allow the tree to survive or at least give it a good shot at it and um one of the things that was decided was that the lanai structure which was originally designed to be a poured co concrete or field cement or whatever you would call it uh, would have been uh, very stressful maybe would have killed the tree so it was changed so that the bulk of the lanai would be just simple pavers, uh, which would recall, require just a minimal excavation. And there would only be poured concrete on a, a sidewalk part, a, a small landing in front of the doors. Um, so there was, you know, so generally about probably 80% of it would be just pavers with a, with a small, uh, you know, easy excavation and the um, heavy duty so it cut back on the excavation. It was a really nice design, really thoughtful. And Ann Fel Felver from TJ Holmes, she presented this to you, this plan to you on um, uh, April 12th, 2002. And I spoke and I said, I appreciate the work they did. And you know, that, that I, you know, and I didn't object to this project going through. Um, because they had worked with me and done this. So when I went there today, I found out that the current plan still has the old- 30 seconds. Okay, it has an old cement. It still has the old plan because they didn't update the plan that was sent in with your packet. The packet plan wasn't the same plan that was shown at the meeting. So they've been using that packet plan to uh, I guess to do to do the process so far. Luckily, it's not approved. But basically, um, I've told the people that they've got to go back and get the correct plan. Not three minutes are up now. Sorry.
Uh, you could finish your sentence, I think would be fine. Why don't we let that happen if that's okay, Mr. Bruder? So, Absolutely. yeah, the, so it should be what was agreed upon and what was shown at that meeting um, is. Terrific, thank you um, for that. Um, and Mr. Perter, thank you for noting the three minutes. That was not the issue. It's my um, my call on extending a little bit on that. Um, I know we have another public comment, but can I ask um, to Ms. Sandmeyer, um, is that an issue if the Planning Commission approved a project based on a packet that is not the packet that's been utilized? And how would a member of the public go about um, getting that clarified? Should they be in touch with somebody in the Planning Department? Yes, um, so Fatin Khan's working on this um, to make sure all the, con the conditions of approval are included in the building permit set. Um, this project did have a project specific condition um, to ensure the tree would be protected for the arborist report. Um, so we'll make sure that um, the correct set is approved as part of the building permit. Terrific, thank you for that clarification. All right, let's move on to our next public comment. Thank you again, Chair DeCardi. Uh, next public commenter is a person by the name of Elizabeth McCarthy. Uh, at this time, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. And again, um, I apologize for the interruptions when I make them, but uh, you'll be reminded when you have 30 seconds and when you have uh, no time left for your three minute public comment, which begins when you start speaking. And again, if you could please state your name and your jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment, that would also be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. This is Elizabeth McCarthy. I live at 1920 Minolto across from Cafe Zoe. I made public comment um, a couple weeks ago at your meeting. So um, I don't know if y'all have had a chance to read the front page article on the Palo Alto Daily Post from July 22nd um, or not, but just briefly, the owner of Cafe Zoe is quoted as saying that she plans to continue with her outdoor amplified music concerts without a permit. Um, this is in contrast to what your planner Thomas Rogers was quoted as saying in the article, which is that the cafe does need a permit. Um, now the cafe has had outdoor concerts for the last two Fridays on July 15th and 22nd. Now on July 15th, I did not want to call the police on the cafe. So I called my Menlo Park City Council, I called planner Thomas Rogers, and I called code enforcement Deborah Cavillo. Um, and then Deborah Cavillo, code enforcement, again reminded the owner on July 19th that she can't, she's not permitted to have these outdoor concerts. Um, so then when the concert again happened last Friday on July 22nd, both my neighbor and I very reluctantly called the police department because that's what I was told to do the, the week prior, right? So the poor officer, um, bless his heart, he, he said that he, he was aware of the notation made by code enforcement to cite Cafe Zoe for a violation. However, then he said that the cafe owner showed him an email from the Menlo Park police chief to Cafe Zoe saying that they were okay to have their outdoor concerts without a permit. So I guess this seemed really clear to code enforcement and to your planner, but not clear to the police department and not clear to the cafe owner. So my question is, and I know you can't answer specific questions, but can the planning commission maybe just provide some general information on how uh, planning and police and the cafe owner and the neighbors can get all on the same page because none of us want to call the police. We know that the police, they have plenty else to do other than deal with this. So any general guidance you can provide, I would really appreciate it. Thank you for your comment. Um, uh, Given that this is a essentially implementation and enforcement, it would be to go back to the planning staff or the appropriate person uh, in, uh, in the city um, to both, if there is a discrepancy to clarify and then to communicate. Um, 
this isn't something that would be uh, in the purview of the planning commission per se. And having said that, I'm again going to uh, as, ask for any general guidance from the Sandmeyer to see if I've spoken um, inappropriately in any way there. Uh, yes, thank you. That's correct, uh, Chair DeCarty and uh, Ms. McCarthy, we will be um, in touch with you. We've received the emails and are aware of the concerns. So thank you for letting us know. And we will be in touch. Great. Thank you, Ms. Sandmeyer. Mr. Pruder, any other hands for uh, public comment? Thank you, Chair DeCarty. At this time, I see no other hands, uh, but we could quickly remind the public if you wanted to provide public comment, press the hand icon or on the phone. Star nine uh, will be the buttons you press. Um, we've been waiting for a while, but if you'd like, we can wait a moment more or you could close the public comment period. Yeah, I think my sense is that folks have had a chance to raise their hand. So why don't we go ahead and close public comment? Thank you, Mr. Pruder. We'll now move on to the consent calendar. Uh, and as I jumped ahead previously, we do not have uh, any items to approve this evening. And that will move us to items under public hearing, that's F on our agenda this evening. First one is a use permit for the, excuse me if I mispronounce, Safe Design Group for 1262 Middle Avenue. This is a request for a use permit to demolish an existing one-story residence, construct a new two-story residence on a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot area and width in the R1S. That's the single family residential suburban zoning district. This includes an attached accessory dwelling unit, ADU, which is not subject to discretionary review. And I believe I am turning over um, to uh, Ms. Khan for this. Am I, oh, excuse me, I'm not, to um, Mr. Chan for this. Do I have that right? That's correct. Thank you, Chair Ducardi. There are no further uh, staff comments to provide for item F1. I would like to note that the applicant, Mr. Safe, is here to provide you a brief presentation, as well as the property owner, uh, Mr. Merabian. He's also here to answer any questions. So I, I will turn it over to the project applicant. Great, thank you and welcome to you both. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Ducardi and uh, everyone else. Um, I would like to have Aman Mehrabian, the owner, uh, pre uh, present and introduce himself and his family, and I'll uh, do a short presentation thereafter. Hi, everyone. This is Aman. Uh, good evening. My name is Shirin. Yeah, and we have a two and a half year old who's just running around. He's just a bit too hyper energetic for to sit down. Uh, just to keep it short, we're super excited uh, to build this house. We basically, well, we've been living in a the small, here it comes, a small apartment in San Francisco. And you can imagine having a pandemic and lockdown with a hyper energetic two-year-old is not the best combination. So uh, we're super excited to have a bigger house with some backyard, hopefully, and uh, Oh, here he is. Sorry about the interruption. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, sorry, my wife is going to just. Uh, so yeah, and we love the neighborhood, not just for the great school, but also for the green, uh, beautiful nature. And this will be our first single family home with some backyard. We really hope it helps with the kid. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. So, uh, Calvin, if uh, I don't know who is going to load the, um, uh, that's the, am I able to control this presentation? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to press control L. Oops. Screen. So we're at uh, 1262 Middle Avenue. Um, uh, it's a, a substandard lot with a narrow width of 48 uh, feet wide uh, in, 
in the depth of 160. So we're super narrow, super long. And that's why we are here in front of you today uh, for our substandard in size and width. Um, the location is a interior size, interior lot on the uh, Middle Avenue corridor next to um, uh, adjacent to Hermosa, uh, but not quite. It's just a second lot next to Hermosa Way. Um, and the lot size and dimensions are noted here on the track map. The uh, neighborhood inspirations that we uh, did by a few uh, within a few blocks from us are um, quite quite a diverse uh, architectural fabric with uh, more modern architecture as being the newer uh, construction projects uh, nearby. Um, I have noted the addresses in front of um, the presentation for your review. Uh, this is uh, directly across from us, uh, a uh, modern farmhouse. And this is the property that's adjacent to us on the left hand side on Hermosa Way, and then some of the other projects on Hermosa Way that are going on at this time. Um, just to kind of give us an initial uh, understanding of the fabric of the neighborhood, uh, of what's there as you experience the city. Uh, we have designed a, a modern and contemporary high-tech home with um, siding, a trespass siding that does not fade, um, and uh, with a light color, um, almost white, but uh, slightly um, with a little bit of uh, gray in it. Um, it's a smooth stucco with aluminum clad windows with black or dark gray uh, window cladding. Um, I keep this presentation short, but I just wanted to address the fact that we have taken um, extreme measure into making sure that the privacy of the uh, owners and the properties next door to us uh, are uh, kept uh, and being respectful to the nature as well as the privacy of those um, those involved. We have provided uh, 10 replacement trees throughout the site where uh, visibility would be um, essentially uh, compromised with the windows, anything that we would have, and cover those with trees uh, to give the, uh, give the neighbors and the owners privacy. Um, I'll be here if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the presentation for the commission. Before we move to public comment, are there any clarifying questions for staff or for the applicant this evening? All right. Seeing none, Mr. Pruder, I will turn to you again for public comment on item F1. Hey, thank you, Chair DeCardi, once again. Um, and we have public comment for this item. Members of the public, you can press the hand icon or on phone, you can dial star nine uh, to be allowed the opportunity to speak publicly on this item. At the moment, I don't see any hands raised for this item, uh, but I'm happy to wait a moment if you'd like, uh, and then we can close the public comment. Great, let's just wait a moment. All right. All right, how did the waiting do for us? Uh, yielded no results, so if you'd like, you can close it. Well, all right, with that, I will close public comment and bring it back to the virtual dais for commissioner questions or comments or discussion. Would anybody like to begin? Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I'll start by asking um, through the chair if I could ask the designer uh, what other options for locating the ADU were considered um, such that the heritage oak would not need to be removed. Yeah, and that's completely fine. So to the applicant. Um, Commissioner Riggs, so we we have uh, tried to put it in the backyard, um, but uh, both fiscally as well as uh, um, condition, 
uh, of the tree and the arborist's report did not result in keeping the tree even if we were um, developing um, the back option of the ADU. This was communicated to the planning um, and the um, heritage tree, um, the town's uh, or the city's arborist, and they have, we have communicated that option with them and they agree that there's no option for keeping the tree. Number three. Did I misunderstand? Um, I realized there's, a, I believe it was a dead property on the tree, uh, but tree number three was indicated as proposed for removal to accommodate ADU and there was no other indication about its health. Uh, no, but the setbacks, uh, the 10 foot setbacks wouldn't also be sufficient, but we have communicated that with the the project arborist as well as the city arborist, uh, that there wouldn't be any option for keeping it. Based on uh, your preference to have the ADU at the front of the lot. The issue also that it raises is the uh, financial uh, hardship that it occurred, that it doesn't allow us, it doesn't allow the owners to build an ADU with respect to that. There's a cost difference when you're doing detached versus attached. Uh, that cost is immensely higher when you're doing it detached. And we have gotten proposals from contractors that uh, we shared with the um, town, the city's arborist that agrees with this fact that we cannot uh, keep the tree. Commissioner Riggs, uh, Ms. Sandemeyer has come on video. Perhaps we could turn to her for a second, if that's OK. Yes, please. Yeah, through the chair, I just want to add a quick reminder that the ADU is not discretionary. So um, I would recommend the Planning Commission focus on the, the primary residence. Uh, with permission, Commissioner Riggs, could I ask for clarification the, for everybody? Uh, Ms. It Sandmeyer, would also be an option for the property owner not to include the ADU since it's not discretionary. So that could be connectivity on my end, but I had trouble hearing the last piece of what you said, Ms. Sandemeyer. But I think uh, I did as well. I, I, it sounds like there's a bandwidth problem, um, perhaps at Ms. Sandemeyer's end. Um, I would note that I'm not questioning the presence or the design quality or materials of the ADU, its square footage or anything, only its location on the plan. Um, and I'm not aware that there is uh, uh, any um, state restriction on discussing the location of the ADU um, if it does not um, result in a prevention of the construction of the ADU. So um, with due respect, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I do question that the ADU could not have been an attached portion at the left rear of the building. Um, I also uh, would like to comment on the stairwell. Uh, I appreciate that there's been an attempt to um, address privacy uh, by planting um, uh, well-grown English laurels um, in a row uh, that would create a hedge upon planting and, planting, and then are expected to grow uh, to perhaps 40 feet. Um, I wondered what, um, what consideration was given as these trees get older and thicker and the owner will inevitably want to um, address the overgrowth of four trees planted close together. So uh, through the chair, this would be a question for either the designer or the owner. Yes, by all means. Um, Commissioner Riggs, so uh, we are working with our landscape architect uh, as well uh, for the development of the building application and the building submission package. Uh, in response to your previous question, uh, we have also tried putting it, so the right side is also blocked. We cannot have it blocked on the, the right side because there are two oak trees that are larger and more valuable 
and we're trying to preserve those um, and the, the root system for those trees. So um, on that side, we cannot have them. The back side, uh, we have a problem for uh, privacy of the owners because of the location of the ADU. Um, if it was supposed, if it was supposed, if it, I guess if it was connected to the back side of the, the it would kind of eliminate the privacy of um, the main house. So uh, it, it's been it's been thought through, and we have gone back and forth quite a bit because of the, the limitations of the width of this lot. Um, and the fiscal issues that this arises if we were to do the detach, that's kind of we, uh, the limitations we're working with on that. Regarding the overgrowth and the landscape of the trees that are there, um, we're working on that with our landscape architect. The English laurel specifically does not grow super wide. It just goes up quite a bit. So uh, we'll work with them and make sure that the spacing is sufficient for growth um, once we submit to the building uh, package as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Other questions or comments from commissioners? While people are thinking, I would like to follow up with um, Ms. Sandmeyer just to clarify um, Commissioner Riggs's statement at the end around the placement of the ADU and a heritage tree. Um, so um, is that in fact something that we can't discuss, number one? And I guess number two, can you remind us of, the app, of uh, how the heritage tree policy is applied? And if there is a circumstance where the state mandate uh, on an ADU could result in superseding the Menlo Park heritage tree policy such that a heritage tree would come down when it otherwise wouldn't. Could you clarify both of those? Yes, and I apologize. I think something happened with my connection. I got knocked out of the meeting for a moment. Um, but yes, yeah, so the ADU is just is not discretionary. Um, so you know, I recommend that the planning commission just focus on the discretionary use permit request. Um, the applicant would also have the option of not including the ADU on their plans and adding it later. Um, so that's something to consider. As far as the heritage tree, it's um, for ADUs, it's basically the same process as a house um, or a structure that doesn't require a use permit. So there's still an evaluation of the health and an evaluation of the cost. Um, if the to build in a way that the tree could be retained. So that, that does go through a process, um, but the, the ADU is not part of the discretionary use permit request. But just to try to see if I understand this correctly, the heritage tree process is applied in the same way for um, a proposed development, whether in this instance, it would have an ADU associated with it or not. Is that correct? Yeah, it would basically be the same. I think the nuance is if the the if the primary residence requires a use permit, as it does in this case, and then a heritage tree would need to be removed to build that primary residence where it's proposed, then the planning commission could deny that use permit, and then the tree would remain, or the planning commission could add conditions to. Um, change the design to preserve the tree, but in the case of the ADU, it's not part of the discretionary action, so the planning commission doesn't have that discretion. All right, and just one last thing, because I don't want to take forever on this. Um, if this were not a substandard lot, if this were just going to staff, then this would, would staff have the discretion to ask that the primary residence be reconfigured in such a way to protect a heritage tree or not? Well, it goes through a process. It would still go through the process with the city arborist where the tree, uh, there was an evaluation of the um, cost of the tree and an evaluation of the cost of alternative designs to save the tree. Um, and then that's just reviewed by the city arborist and a decision would be made. 
Thank you very much. Commissioner Thomas, you've been very patient. <laughs> Let me turn to you for your question or comment. Thank you, Chair Ducardi. Um, yeah, so it sounds like the, the tree number three issue is kind of been decided. I think one reason why you know this is maybe slightly more important than, than in other circumstances is that um, you know, that tree is kind of along the frontage of the property, which is along Middle Avenue, which is a pretty widely traffic conduit through Menlo Park. Um, but it sounds like that has been decided. So uh, I guess my take on this is it's a very substandard lot and it's currently not conform conforming. I forget it's on, on one side or both. Um, but after these changes, it will be conforming. And um you know the 10 english laurel replacement trees um all that seems reasonable uh one thing that is also interesting but i think it um is also okay you know is this uh new development is right up on the edge of the setback for the front um and, and likely strategically saving uh kind of 62 feet in the rear for a large backyard um, so yeah, I think everything here is, is good and I, uh, am ready to motion to approve after other commissioners have made their comments. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas. So we have a motion to approve as submitted by staff. Uh, do we have a second or do we have other commissioner comments? Vice Chair Harris? Uh, I'll second. So we have a first from Commissioner Thomas, a second from Vice Chair Harris. Any other questions or discussion before moving toward a vote? All right, seeing none, we'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, with Commissioner Barnes. Alphabetically, I am a yes. Commissioner Doe. Uh, yes. Vice Chair Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. is a thumbs up, uh, so that is a yes. Uh, Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Uh, I will vote yes as well. So that I apologize, is... Mr. Chair. Uh, I meant my vote to be uh, in the negative uh, and had a little trouble technically here. I apologize. All right, so Commissioner Riggs has voted no. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Thomas has voted yes. I will vote yes. So the project is approved uh, five to one. Uh, with Commissioner Tate not with us this evening. Uh, congratulations. Good luck with your project and with your uh, uh, family and your and your two-year-old. Thanks, um, Thank you. Thank you. To staff, anything else on this item before we close? Nothing additional for this item. Thank you, Chair Ducardi. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chen. We'll now move to item F2 on the agenda. Uh, this is a master sign program, Oscar Ibarra, 1300 El Camino Real. This is the Spring Line project. Request for a master sign program for a mixed use development Spring Line in the SPECRD, that's the El Camino Real, Real Downtown Specific Plan Zoning District uh, with the staff report. And I believe this one I am turning over uh, to Ms. Khan um, to lead us through. I am having trouble hearing you, Ms. Khan, if you were talking. Still nothing, and I have other commissioners shaking their heads. We'll hang on for a moment. It looks like Ms. Khan's jumped down and is jumping back in to reconnect. All right, maybe try that, Ms. Khan. Oh, it's still not 
working, I don't think. Oh, that's too bad. To staff, Ms. Sandemeyer staff, is there a workaround we can do here, a phone connection or something? Um, yeah, I think uh, Ms. Khan can call in, um, but for now, I believe the applicant has a presentation, so we could go ahead to that. All right, terrific. We'll do that. We'll move to the um, presentation by the applicant. Um, Mr. Barra, do I have that right? Um, pronouncing your name um, and welcome. And then we'll return to Ms. Khan when she reconnects. Um, thank you for being here this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Let me get the presentation here on full screen mode. Um, that was summarized. As was summarized, what we are reviewing tonight and presenting is the proposed master sign program for signage at the Springline property in Menlo Park. So moving on to page two, the property is located within, as previously mentioned, the ECR DSP zoning district. It's located in between Glenwood Avenue, Oak Grove Avenue, Garwood Way, and El Camino Rao as shown here on the map. For the project background, the Springland Community Development Project was approved by City Council on January 24th, 2017. And from the early onset, uh, it was identified that there was a need for additional signage allocation for a large property such as the Springland property. Therefore, study sessions were conducted with City Council from 2017 to February of 2022. Throughout this time, community outreach was facilitated at several farmers markets with the response being uh, positive from the public. So the approved signage amendment to the City of Menlo Park signage ordinance was approved on March of 2022 with a special designation for properties within the ECRDSP provided that a master sign program would go through the planning commission and through the necessary process for review and approval. For the Spring Light property itself, uh, as previously mentioned, it is a large property within this specific zoning district. It is a 6.4 acre mixed use development consisting of two 100,000 square foot office buildings, a residential building with 183 residences, a dual level subterranean parking garage and substantial public outdoor space for both tenants and the surrounding community. Here is a brief overview of the master sign program. The intent of the master sign program is to promote the health, safety, welfare of property owners and residents of the city, to introduce a set of signage standards that will guide tenant signage project identification signage, and campus wayfinding signage to complement the surrounding architectural elements. Above all, to remain consistent with the intent of the City of Menlo Park sign ordinance and the city's design guidelines for signs. So given the special allowance for properties within the ECR DSP zoning district, the total allowable sign area is 1,100 seven square feet. However, the proposed master sign program only is proposing to use 675 square feet of this available sign area. As you can see here, this is a brief overview of the signage family within the property. There is a property identification signage, which is listed as the A1 Arcway signage. There are tenant IDs for uh, community serving uses on the ground floor. There are parapet tenant IDs. There's also directional signage to aid pedestrians and vehicular traffic to the appropriate destination by means of parking signage leading to the dual subterranean uh, parking garage. There are pedestrian directories and pedestrian wayfinding signs throughout the courtyard and throughout the uh, property itself. There is a wayfinding blade sign, and there is also blade signage for the community serving uses that will make use of it. So um, 
For the most part, the master sign program conforms to the signage ordinance, the design guidelines for signs, and the amended language within the signage ordinance. We are seeking a variance for directional signage to assist pedestrians and any foot traffic within the property itself. The Menlo Park design guideline for signs states, no more than one freestanding sign should be placed on each street frontage of a development parcel. On Oak Grove Avenue, we have one directional sign. And on El Camino Real, we have another directional sign. However, along Garwood Way, we have potentially three directional signs. One would not be visible from public right of way. The other two are at key locations alongside Garwood Way to help pedestrians and residents within the property be able to identify their destination and the proper path to get there. And we are also seeking a variance for parapet tenant IDs. The Menlo Park Design Guideline for Sign states, in general, lettering between eight inches and 18 inches is considered acceptable. Lettering larger than 24 inches may be considered for buildings with large setbacks from the street. However, given the height of these buildings, the viewing, the viewing angles, an increased height serves to properly guide pedestrians and allows for proper tenant visibility given the proposed height of these signs. As you can see in these two examples, both the, most of the signs will be installed or viewed at above 40 feet above the fixed floor. So increasing this height to 30 and 48 inches allows these tenants to have proper visibility for signage. That sums up a brief overview and summary of the master sign program that we are proposing for tonight. So if there's any questions, I'll be here to help answer and uh, clarify any additional questions or concerns. Terrific, thank you, Mr. Ibarra for being here and for your presentation. I'm gonna check back to see if Ms. Khan is able to Talk Good evening, this. Commissioners. Are you yes. able to hear me now? Yes, we are. Welcome. And thank okay. you for working through that. <laughs> thank you for having me back. Um, so uh, I do not have any um, updates to the staff report, and you've already seen the presentation. So staff and the applicant uh, is available for any uh, questions that the commissioners may have. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, with that, are there any clarifying questions for either staff or the applicant before we move to public comment? And then we'll have time afterwards for further questions and discussion. So to the commission, any clarifying questions at this time? All right, seeing none, Mr. Pruder, you are on again as we open public comment for item F2. All right, thank you very much again. Chair DeCardi, uh, at this time, I don't see any hands, but as a reminder, uh, members of the public can use the hand icon. Uh, we do have a hand raised now. Uh, just quickly, uh, folks can raise their hand by pressing that hand icon again, and also if by calling by on, by phone, uh, they can press star nine. And our commenter, first commenter, um, I will uh, introduce if uh, that's all right, Chair DeCardi. <laughs> Sorry. Of course. All right. Um, the first commenter I see is a person by the name of Fran Dean. And um, just so you're aware, you'll be able to speak once I allow you to unmute yourself. You'll have three minutes to speak. And because we don't have a clock available to put on the screen, I will remind you when there are 30 seconds remaining and when there are no uh, seconds remaining for your three minute comment period. If you could please state your name and your jurisdiction at the beginning, we would greatly appreciate that as well. And at this time, uh, your comment may begin. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Fran Dean, and I'm with the Memo Park Chamber of Commerce. And you've heard me speak many times um, about signage. Over the last year, planning has hosted study sessions and hearings, which culminated in a successful zoning amendment for a project like this, a unique mixed use development within the El Camino Real downtown specific plan. With that conclusion, Spring Springline has now been able to move forward, develop their master sign program, which is before you this evening for review, 
The master plan as submitted properly identifies the project and their tenants. Of equal importance are the wayfinding aspects, which will provide directional ingress, ingress, and, ingress and egress, which is particular importance to help patrons safely and predictably access the complex along El Camino Real and Garwood Way. And once they're familiar with the project, perhaps some of those signs aren't necessary, but right now they are. People know where, need to know how to park, how to access the facility. We definitely agree with staff recommendation and findings. The Springline Master Sign Program is compatible and harmonious with the buildings and the scale of the new development. We look forward to your comments and approval this evening. And with that, welcome the opening of this project, its tenants and its residents. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Dean. Mr. Perter, any other comments? At this time, I don't see any other comments or hands raised. Um, so if you'd like, we could wait a little longer or we could close the public comment period. Let's go ahead and wait for just a few moments. All right, any luck this time with the waiting? No luck, no additional commenters have raised their hand. All right, let's go ahead and close public comment. Thank you, Mr. Pruder. Uh, we'll come back to the virtual dais to the commission for any questions, discussion, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Chair DeCardi. Uh, and thank you to the, the applicant for bringing this uh, with us or to us again this evening. Uh, I must say that I am, uh, well, in looking at the plans and looking at what's being contemplated, uh, I appreciate what you brought forward. And my point was, I must say that I am also um, liking that staff weighed in on this uh, as well. I think certainly from my perspective, I was waiting for that point where staff would look at this from the purposes of, of best practices and what would work for this location and the overall plan. And as I look at the conclusion uh, for this plan, it says staff believes a proposed signage in the master sign program would be proportionate, compatible and harmonious with the buildings on the property given the scale of the of the development. I agree with that. The design of the project's identification signage is compatible with the project's overall architecture and is appropriate in terms of size and location within the project given its height and central location. And we know where it is, you know, in Menlo Park along El Camino. And then the proposed colors and signage designs would complement the primary white and tan, excuse me, tan colors of the buildings as well as the brown and red colors of the clay roofing. So for, for those reasons, um, said well in the conclusion part of the staff report. I think this is, uh, this as brought forward, accomplishes what it's set out to. I have no problem with the, the variances associated with this. I think they make sense. I think they're accretive to the, to the project. Um, and with that, I would like to make a motion that we approve the master sign program as put forward in the uh, staff report in with the conditions of approvals, obviously as called out in the staff report. Um, so I'll put a I'll put a first on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. So we have a uh, first on the table for uh, approval uh, as submitted by staff, Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. Uh... I uh, certainly generally support that. And I continue to be um, particularly grateful to the Springline Group and Mr. Ibarra in particular for all the effort in creating a sign program that we can refer to as a city, um, which we obviously needed and were not able to produce. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. Um, and the first, uh, if I may, through the chair from Ms. Khan, I'm noting the uh, restrict, voluntary restriction of colors here to white, black, and gray. Uh, and I'm just wondering 
uh, you know, with the exception of company logos, uh, did we give any consideration to having the first floor signage, especially the blade signs, frankly, being more colorful? Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, Chair, Commissioner Riggs, sorry. <laughs> so um, the colors that were chosen were chosen by the applicant team, and this is what uh, staff reviewed and brought forward to the commission tonight. Uh, staff did not provide uh, any sort of restrictions in terms of colors that the applicant could uh, propose on the first floor. I believe it was their intention to keep this color scheme. However, if they were to proceed with a, a little bit uh, more color, they are, they are able to do so as long as the color scheme is consistent and compliant with the uh, colors mentioned in our sign design guidelines. So as I recall, that says no bright red and no bright yellow, but otherwise it's pretty open? Correct. All right, and, and, and there is a path for red and yellow, um, such as for logos? Yes, through the sign program, yes. All right, but well, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that that is available. And um, uh, just to Mr. Ibarra and, and um, any Springline um, leaders listening, um, I really don't think it would hurt either the project or Menlo Park to have a little bit of color at the retail level. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, and then just to confirm, Ms. Khan, um, the square footage of signage when they're individual letters, do I recall that we draw a box around the letter and measure that? Yes. Ah, okay. All right, that seems a reasonable way to, to do it so that individual letters don't accumulate to uh, more square footage. I guess I do just have one concern. Um, and I'm gonna, I guess if I can, I'll bring up my own uh, image of the, well, for myself, of, of, of the building major tenant uh, signage. Um, I have to admit the scale of something that's um, uh, more than three feet is uh, in, in height, at least as rendered uh, in the application, seems rather dramatic. Um, and one of the things that we uh, used as a comparison was the... Um, was either the 1706 El Camino or the 1906 El Camino, I think 1906, um, where uh, they felt they did not have sufficient ID because of their angle of view or something like that. And so they have a great giant address that is out of proportion for all other addresses on El Camino and even out of proportion of its own building. And I wanted to avoid, um, well, this isn't as dramatic as that. The, the indication on um, our attachment C, sheet C53 for uh, the sample name of Norwest, um, I think will appear positively giant from just across El Camino. Uh, El Camino is maybe only a hundred feet wide. It's not as if it's a quarter mile away. And, and frankly, that, that Norwest sign looks like it's designed to be viewed from at least a quarter mile away. Um, and I am wondering whether other commissioners, um, particularly those who would remember previous discussions on this application and, and trying to keep building top signage uh, somewhat uh, under, uh, under control, we thought we had concurrence actually from the Springline group. And um, so I guess I'd like to hear, um, hear something about why we would at this final stage be recommending something so large at the parapet level. Yeah, Commissioner Riggs, is that a question of the applicant? Um, 
or, or just a comment? Well, I, I, think I don't mean just a comment, but a, a, in addition yeah. to your comment. No, that, that's fair. I, I think I'd like to start it with a, as a question for Ms. Khan, um, who I think has been with the program for a little bit. And okay. how did it develop this far? Uh, yes, Commissioner uh, Rick. So we did look at the proposal as a whole, and given that the buildings were set back from the property line, it seemed like it would be a um, adequate height for the sign and for what they are proposing. It seemed like a feasible um, sort of height request, which is why we brought it forward with the height request that the applicant has, especially because it is a bigger development and given the fact that they are set back from the property line. All right, um, so I can certainly appreciate the argument as an argument, but I will note that uh, the particularity of the El Camino downtown specific plan is that the setbacks were actually minimized um, so we have notably less setback than the um, uh, slate building that houses Cafe Baroni, for example, um, and a rather similar height. And um, I don't think we have any trouble um, looking at that building, uh, reading the clock or so forth. Um, so at least from my point of view, and, and I have to say my memory of our consensus from starting two meetings back, we didn't really want to see something quite this large at the parapet. Um, so I, I would like to, I, I would actually like to support this project and I would like to uh, second the, um, the motion and, and in particular um, indicate, as Mr. Barnes did, that I particularly find um, the directional signage is very much uh, uh, in need and the request is appropriate um, that the required findings can be made. And, um, uh, and uh, I think, uh, Another exception was also asked for, and I don't see my note here. So um, I'd like to second, but I'd like to make the friendly amendment that um, we somewhat reduce the parapet signage height. Um, and I understand that 24 inches may not be big enough, but I just don't think that um, up to 40 inches is appropriate. And I wondered if the, uh, if the maker uh, would consider that friendly amendment. So I thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, I am inclined to go with uh, the staff recommendation and my own my own eyes. I did travel, I mean, I did go to the area um, in front of the buildings and spend some time looking up at, at them and trying to scope the size of signage. And I don't believe that uh, 40 inches is, is, is up to uh, 40 inches is, is onerous. And um, these are commercial buildings. Uh, these buildings, uh, I don't believe, will uh, be at all representative of a uh, oversigned area. I think they're appropriate for the scale of this building. I think any less is uh, not doing justice to the building for what's available in like and similar jurisdictions. Uh, this is not... Uh, in my opinion, Carmel, this is a, you know, this is a, a normal commercial corridor for Menlo Park. So I think it's the appropriate height and I think it works um, on these buildings, given the scale of these buildings. And if my recollection is correct, I think Commissioner Doran was a lead on the size of the sign. It was no longer 
on the commission. I don't, I respect your opinion, but I don't share the concern. As a matter of fact, I think the sizing is absolutely appropriate. So respectfully, I would decline that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Riggs. So uh, I believe we have a first from Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Riggs, I, I did not hear a second then, but I turn back to you for clarification or further comment. Thank you. Uh, I think you read that well. Um, the, um, uh, I would just like to withdraw the second, um, but okay. without prejudice for the rest of the project. Terrific. Other commissioner comments, questions? We have a first on the table. Vice Chair Harris. Uh, I would like to second the motion by Commissioner Barnes. Thank you. All right. We now have a first and a second from Vice Chair Harris. Any other questions before we move to a vote or comments from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Thomas. Yeah, so when I was looking this over, the, the size of the tenant ID did, did kind of catch my eye, um, but I think uh, people in Menlo Park are, are pretty happy with how this, you, you know, the aesthetics of this pro, uh, project so far and, you know, the entire proposal seems um, pretty reasonable in its, its entirety. I guess the one thing I'm noticing now after uh, Commissioner Rick's comments are that the total, like, height of that parapet is only 53 inches and the maximum uh, height of the tenant ID can be 48. And just wanted to highlight that, yeah, that doesn't leave much of a buffer and doesn't make me a little more concerned than I was before that conversation. That's all. All right, uh, thank you, Commissioner Thomas. Other commissioner comments or questions? Um, I would like to uh, share a couple things. Um, I, I will not be voting uh, uh, for this and for the reasons that Commissioner Riggs has highlighted. He's been, I think, very diplomatic. Um, I think this is a mistake. I think a 48 uh, inch sign uh, in a community like Menlo Park is exactly the wrong direction. You can see a sign like that easily from a quarter mile away, even longer. I don't see the need for that uh, for wayfinding. Um, and I don't think it fits in a community where we're trying to have a uh, pedestrian, pedestrian and community scale to have parapet signs that are that large um, uh, uh, drawing attention. I can understand it from an advertising standpoint, but I don't think that's in the best interest of our community. Um, so as much as I really want to echo and thank Mr. Senandaji, Ibarra, and Springline for navigating through your project and helping us as a city do something we should have done, which is to put these measures in place, I really thank you for that. I think the rest of your signage is fabulous and at scale and works, and I'm certainly ready to approve the variance on the directional signing for all the reasons you uh, stated. I think the blade signing looks good. I also want to note that we've got, through your help, a policy now that would have allowed you to have nearly double the square footage, and you chose not to. I think that's fabulous for community scale, pedestrian scale, and would almost say that it's a bit of a shame that somehow our city council, that we have approved um, something that could have so much signage, uh, when you all believe that's not necessary for the success of your project. Uh, so I am a big fan of everything you have done through to this city, but I completely disagree with the need and the scale for the variance to go up to 48 inches. Um, I think Mr. Thomas makes a good point. Um, I think Mr. Riggs made excellent points. And so I will not vote for this um, as submitted, would absolutely entertain a motion that would vote uh, enthusiastically for all of it, but for that second variance, uh, if that were a direction the commission wanted to go. Um, I didn't state that as a question, but I, I will gladly um, restate that as a question to the applicant since both uh, Mr. Senanjaji and Mr. Ibarra have their hands up. Um, if Mr. Um, Ibarra, since you've been taking the lead, why don't, why don't you um, go from there and you can turn to Mr. Senanjaji if you'd like. 
Yeah, point, point, first I'm sorry, and foremost, Commissioner uh, Descartes, I don't, um, I think, uh, I'm sorry, if I'm understanding this correctly, if, you, if, if we're looking for a concession on behalf of the applicant prior to the motion that's currently on the table, let's clear the motion that's on the table. And then proceed. If I'm if I'm understanding your 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 question to the applicant, uh, no, my I, preference yeah. would be to to have yep. that vote on the first and see where that lands, yeah. and then figure out what happens after that. If I'm understanding that correctly, uh, Commissioner Barnes, I think that's excellent. I was not trying to prejudice in the direction of where I was headed. Um, I simply noted that the hands of the applicant went up and wanted to give them the opportunity um, to respond. But I think your point is well taken. Uh, that I was, um, we are, we have a first and a second. Commissioners have a right to uh, opine. I have done that, but I think you're right and correct that uh, the way we should handle this is uh, with the first and the second in a vote, uh, and then we'll see if there's any need to go further from there. So I will I will take that um, as excellent guidance, Commissioner Barnes. Um, so um, with that, uh, Mr. Ibarra and Mr. Senadaji, I, I both apologize and hope I'm clear about why we're gonna take this in this order. Um, and I will now turn to a vote. We've got a first from Commissioner Barnes, a second from Vice Chair Harris on the um, proposal as submitted by staff in alphabetical order. We'll go with Commissioner Doe. I think that would be me. I think I'm sorry, Barnes. Geez, sorry. Go ahead, Barnes. And I want to say, Commissioner uh, Ducardi, I in no way was I looking to take any of this process to pass. So I want to be okay. absolutely clear on that. And if there are any general comments as it relates to this, then you know we, we have a I think we have a very good policy here at Planning Commission, which is to say, let's hear it and then move forward. If if we feel like we've said what we said as it relates to the current. Uh, motion on the table, I'm happy to go ahead and, and vote. And it, 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 so would that be a correct understanding that it's time to just go after this one and see it's, what happens? It's time to go. And I, I think it takes a village. We're doing great. Good job, Mr. Barnes. And I appreciate it. Sorry to, to then bypass on my <laughs> inability to get alphabetical order yet again. So with uh, the, the motion on the table, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I vote yes on this motion. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Vice Chair Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Uh, that would be a no. Commissioner Thomas. No. I will vote no. Uh, that has us three to three. So the um, proposal does not pass. Um, so we will come back for further discussion or entertain uh, another motion. Um, with that, um, I will now take my previous statement and um, turn over to Mr. Ibarra for um, uh, any clarification or comment on my previous statement uh, in this and, and Mr. Senandaji, if you would like. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank everyone here for their time. We really appreciate it. And I think the Presidio Bay team can speak uh, better on this than I can, but we definitely appreciate all the assistance that the city has provided along the way. Um, we want to be able to provide tenants a proper visibility. We want to be able to guide not just pedestrians, but also vehicular traffic to their proper destination and be able to properly identify where a business is located, whether that be via Garwood Way, via El Camino Route, or even within the courtyard. But in the interest of um, being flexible and being able to uh, adjust, we would be willing to consider a reduction of that max height from 48 inches to 42 inches. And I'll allow, you know, uh, Mr. Cyrus here to comment additional and uh, provide just additional input on this as well. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Mr. Senandaji. Thank you very much, uh, Chair DeCardi and uh, Planning Commissioners. Thank you again for your time. I know we've uh, had numerous meetings on this topic and um, certainly appreciate uh, Commissioner Riggs' uh, position on um, the notion that the intent that we had discussed originally when we were coming up with the uh, signage plan ordinance and the amendment uh, was certainly not to create sort of a billboard-like effect that, you know, is viewable from a mile away, and that's certainly not our intention at all. 
so I think to that end would uh, certainly, and in the interest of, of advancing uh, an approval to the extent that we can appease those concerns would be um, willing to adjust that maximum height. Uh, I, I do think that as originally contemplated and, and candidly, this was um, our challenge is that only after the signage ordinance was adopted, did we bring in the corporate science team who actually manufacture these signs and who are the professionals and kind of weigh in on, on visibility and so on. And so the, the 24 or 36 inch um, height that was originally contemplated um, just was not something that was viewable. And so that's why they had pushed for the 48. That said, uh, to the extent that we can adjust that down uh, to something that perhaps uh, I believe it was Commissioner Thomas had, had suggested that there wasn't sufficient um, margin, if you will, between the top and the bottom of the lettering, given the height of the parapet, you know, 42 inches would would achieve that or even 40 inches um, while still providing for, for the necessary visibility. So to the extent that that's a, a compromise that uh, the commissioners um, who uh, have opposed the, the, the overall height are, are willing to consider, we would be very appreciative. Um, I did, if, if uh, Chair DeCarty, you would permit me another 30 seconds of comment. I did sure. want to address uh, Commissioner Riggs comment as it relates to color um, and uh, in with respect to logos, particularly for the retailers on the ground floor. That is certainly the um, the hope uh, and the intention. Um, we were going to leave that to each of the retailers um, as they proceeded with their TI, and, and most of them have submitted for TI permits. So um, the, the idea, though, for all the the overall signage is to stick within a consistent uh, color scheme. But to the extent that um, you know, for example, Proper Food wants to use their signature orange, which is really their logo. Uh, to, to create a better uh, way um, or identifier for them that, that we would then permit them to do so and, and hope that that flexibility was uh, clear in the in the overall science plan, uh, master science plan that was presented. Thank hey. you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Sinandaji. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. So we'll come back to the commission. Um, so uh, we deadlocked three to three on the proposal as submitted. Um, Commissioner Riggs. Yes, um, I, I think that it is wonderful teamwork, uh, another version of It Takes a Village. And um, to Mr. Sinandaji, a particular thanks to um, uh, Tolerance for 40 or 42 inches. Um, and my belated thanks to Mr. Thomas for his observation about the parapet height. So I would like to move approval, make the findings. Um, with the uh, one modification that the parapet signage um, be uh, the um, variance be approved at 40 inches. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's my motion. So your motion, Commissioner Riggs, is to approve as um, submitted in the staff report, but for reducing the request on the variance, which is the second one, the parapet for the tenant signage, from a maximum of 48 inches in height to a maximum of 40 inches in height, but still allowing the same potential square footage. Do I have that correct? You do, and thank you for the excellent summary. All right. Um, any other comments or questions uh, or a second on uh, the motion from Commissioner Riggs? Vice Chair Harris. I'll second again. Vice Chair Harris is second. Thank you. All right. Um, I take it, Commissioner Thomas, that's where you were going, um, but if you've taken your hand down, do I have that right? Um, so, that, Commissioner. That is correct. Okay. Uh, then, Commissioner Barnes. Thank you for that. I, I would, if it's permissible through the chair, just to get a, to ask the applicant one more time um, with absolute clarity uh, whether 40 inches works for them um, and if they could take the concession hat off of their head but answer the you know in a world where 
they weren't looking to get a something passed here, but they were looking for what's a good practice for this building to be a commercially viable building in Menlo Park on El Camino. Um, the corporate sign folks told them 48. They had said 42. We heard 40. I'd like to hear super concisely that this in fact serves their commercial interests um, for my edification, maybe not for anyone else's, uh, but it's important to me to hear that. So through the chair, if it's permissible to ask the applicant that question. That's of course. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, uh, I'm happy to take that uh, and prevent Mr. Ibarra from <laughs> forcing a diplomatic answer. Uh, if, if we weren't before this uh, commission and we didn't have a discretionary review, uh, I would say that I would rely wholeheartedly on the professional opinion of our excellent team from corporate science. Uh, and they did propose 48 inches. I think that that said, it, uh, in consideration of sort of the binary choice of having a master signage program, which to date has been relatively delayed considering we've had a number of tenants who have occupied at least the office building for some time with no signage and no directional signage, no wayfinding, um, that uh, again, for the specific tenants that we have granted signage rights to, uh, for example, STG or Norwest as an example, who have uh, less figures in their, in their actual logo or their mark, uh, those are more readily uh, viewable and, and, and can be interpreted easily. Uh, at that 40 uh, inch sort of compromise level. Uh, but in the future, this may hurt the project's ability to sort of grant signage that's actually legible. Um, if certain signs are, and logos or, or types are, are of, of a nature that have more characters, for example, they need to be fit you know, into that same square footage or, or that same overall with, for example, that those tenants are granted on the pair. So there's a reason that corporate science had requested 48. Um, it, I, the, the reason we're willing to and appreciate the ability to compromise at 40 is that the current slew of tenants are not impacted, but that does, uh, again, we're, we're playing to, to make sure that we have some signage as opposed to none and sooner rather than later uh, at this point. So, and, and we appreciate the commission's flexibility as well. And as a yeah. follow on to that, does, in, does 42 make a difference as it, the difference between, does 42 make a material difference to you at this point? And because if you were able to pick 42, uh, does that, do you feel that that gets you closer, not where you want to be, but closer uh, to where you want to go? And is that a material difference to you at any level to go from 40 to 42 inches? Yeah, I think that at this point, you know, it is a game of inches. And so to the extent that 42 is, is available, that would give us more flexibility long term with respect to uh, being able to interchange tenant names and, and signs down the road without having to amend the, the master signage plan, because certainly our intent and the intent of having master signage plan is that we do have that allocation available to us. We have the location and the, and the style, um, you know, set and, and approved at this stage, so we don't have to keep coming back uh, down the road years down the line when, when we have tenants renew or, or have a new tenancy and so on. So. Um, and if I may, just as it relates to a comment that uh, Chair DeCardi had made with respect to the total allocation of square footage, um, we're certainly not uh, precluding ourselves from, from that. It's simply that the, the tenant mix today and the, quanti the number of tenants uh, today that are in the project, given again, for example, STG's logo is simply three characters. If that was a, if that was a longer name, like a Kilpatrick Townsend or some some other sort of long, right? It would then just take up more square footage. So it just so happens that Norwest Ventures is NVP and STG is simply technology partners, but they go by 
STG. And so it's a, it's just a lesser use of square footage. We certainly feel that what was approved um, during the study session by planning uh, and subsequently by city council is certainly appropriate uh, and will allow maximum flexibility from a commercial application standpoint long-term for the viability of this project and, and all the other ones downtown. Great, Commissioner Barnes. Yes, so thank you. So to finish, so thank you for that. Um, and I guess to finish out what I what I heard uh, to me, I will ask the maker if the maker would be willing to go to 42, which 42 inches, which from my perspective balances what seems to be personal preferences, um, albeit you know, personally informed preferences of some of our commissioners versus potentially best practices uh, in the industry. So my request is to the maker, Commissioner Riggs, whether you'd be willing to entertain 42 as the up to maximum height. Uh, through the chair? Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I would say yes, uh, although, um, Uh, I very much appreciate the effort, and I will say uh, a very studied and talented effort to support uh, development interest, which is something we, um, we need and appreciate on this commission. Um, I think we have to see both sides of issues. Um, I also would like to um, get something done in the spirit of compromise. Uh, while I think 40 inches is a good size, um, I've done signage for buildings uh, as much as 63 stories um, and much more commonly uh, at the three-story level. Um, and 40 inches is a good size sign. And you can see that um, I, it would be hard to get far enough away on El Camino um, to have any trouble seeing that. Um, uh, but I also don't want, um, um, this isn't a line in the sand kind of thing. So uh, if, um, I'd actually like to hear from um, Mr. Ducardi before I respond to that, if I may. I appreciate that Commissioner Riggs and I think we could also hear from others um, on this. I will say that we have a first on the floor from Commissioner Riggs and a second from Vice Chair Harris. So this is a, in some regards, a dual request of, uh, of Commissioner Barnes that's on the table um, uh, at this time. I actually, um, in, the, in the spirit of this conversation and for understanding, and I think this is important because it sets a precedent for our community. Um, I do have a question for the applicant which is, uh, so Commissioner Riggs referred to sheet C53 in our packet. Uh, and I'd like to know how far away are we in looking at that perspective on those buildings? So a question of the applicant. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Wasn't sure if that was for me, but the presentation showed some examples of signage that were to be installed at the parapet level. So the mounting height is approximately 40 feet or 44 feet, depending um, on exactly which building it is. And the building setback, if I'm not mistaken, is approximately about 15 feet or so. so uh, the viewing angle, especially more so from a pedestrian level, as you're walking alongside El Camino Rao, the viewing angle is a bit distorted. So the increased height just allows for easier legibility and easier or more clear visibility. Uh, but also it's to provide just proper identification for any of the parapet tenants. Uh, Mr. Ducardi, does that answer your question? 
I, I appreciate it, but unfortunately it doesn't. This is, I, I suppose this is a geometry question. Um, I am looking at that um, facade and I am looking at it from a particular angle. It looks like perhaps it was rendered in a way that I am looking at it the same um, eye level as the pedestrian that is um, shown to be right next to the building. Or it could be that I am actually laying on the ground and that I'm actually um, at grade looking up. But I wanna know how far away I am in looking at that facade from the facade in that rendering. This gets to a question that Commissioner Riggs pointed out, which is um, uh, there are viewing angles that I think are represented in this packet that do not exist uh, in our community and in reality. Uh, and I'm trying to understand if this is one of them or not. So that should, that, that should be a knowable fact in the rendering. Um, uh, you know, are we, are we 40 feet away? Are we 600 feet away? Are we 1500 feet away? That's, a, that's the question. And to Commissioner so, Bar Barnes's point, I appreciate that, that there's an expertise um, difference here, but I also think um, in that case, then we need to be very clear about what we've been presented and as it matches with reality or not. Mr. Ducardi, so to answer your question, on sheet 53 of the master sign program, the, the viewing height or the viewing distance from that person that's shown on the side of the building is 40 feet. Right, but I I'm, think the, que the question is, is from my perspective as somebody looking at that sheet. That's, and if you don't know it, I understand, this is not trying to play gotcha, but, um, but I believe that that is actually quite a distance away. I mean, it has to be, if I'm looking at a pedestrian that is that small, I've gotta be, I mean, I, somebody walking down my block at the end of the block looks a lot taller than that to me. So it seems to me that we are very far away. And I don't have that measurement offhand, but it is something that I could calculate and buy. That's okay. Um, I, I think for the purposes of this evening, I think that's, um, if you can, if you had it, it would be great to know. But Commissioner Riggs, you had the floor. You asked me a question. Um, I'm not, um, I am hopeful that, that we can find a compromise. Um, I'm also hopeful that I am not the deciding vote so that I can actually vote my conscience on this, which is to actually vote no um, for any variance on the height because I think it's unnecessary. So that's where I sit right now. Um, but as the chair, I am trying to get us through to a compromise where we can um, get this project approved because um, these folks have, have worked for a long time and diligently, and we, I don't want us to hold this up. So with your, you have the floor, Commissioner Riggs, perhaps with your permission, I could turn to Commissioner Doe for, for her comment. Oh, yes, certainly. Okay. Commissioner Doe. Um, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on your question, Chair DeCarty, about distance, and I'm wondering if it's just it might have been helpful to see um, on those photographs on C60, C62, um, since that was a human being clearly taking a picture from a certain place, if you could do a photo collage of the sign on the building photograph to experientially um, Yeah, if you, you know, if there were a way to have, instead of looking at elevations, which may be tricky to, you know, know where you're standing from, but here, you know, you're standing across the street and would have, maybe that would be a good place to have um, overlaid those signs. Yeah, Mr. Sinandaji. I unfortunately don't have the presentation handy, but we'd actually provided those mock-ups in the, uh, the, 
the final planning session that we did. Um, and it was certainly well before corporate science was involved, but we had, we had done that to try to demonstrate that very point in terms of the human scale and, and utilizing a real photograph of the building. So I'm not sure if planning oh, thanks, commissioners Dr. have Dr. access. <laughs> yeah. I was, I I've you already were, been here for two months, so I, I probably missed that. I know, so I apologize. But I, I was wondering if maybe one of uh, the other planning commissioners could maybe pull up an old presentation. I can try to find it if, if I'm allowed to present too. I, I can certainly pull it up if I can present. I just need to pull up my laptop. My guess at this moment is that this may not be material to the discussion. I, I do not want to get into a, a hobby horse that is mine and mine only. And I believe we've got direction from the commission that's working toward a good conclusion here. So my suggestion, appreciating um, your willingness to do that. And I really appreciate Commissioner Doe's comment. And it's helpful to think about um, just looking between those two and toggling, very helpful. Um, that perhaps to turn back to Commissioner Riggs, who you were on a progression of thinking, asked me a question, and perhaps you could pick up from there. Um, I think uh, during this time, um, I've been looking back and forth at the images as well, um, and also trying to use memory uh, regarding uh, reading something at 40 feet. Um, for example, if a large mylar balloon were stuck at the top of a tree and said happy birthday on it, um, could you read it? Um, if it just said uh, M&M on it, could you read it? Um, and I think you certainly could read the M&M. &M, and I don't think the balloon would be anything like 42 inches. Um, and then looking at um, looking at the elevation, which was on C53, um, just to be able to comprehend the full building, I think you'd have to be a half a block back, uh, which you cannot be on El Camino since we have minimal sit setbacks there. Um, when you are down the block, you could look at the end of the building, which would um, you know, refer to Garwood Way, except that we don't actually have a corner on Garwood Way. We have a gas station. So um, I think the best angle you could get would probably be um, maybe 100 yards away. At, at, and that would be at some angle diagonally across the intersection at Oak Grove. And um, so I just, I, I don't think this is a legibility issue. I certainly don't think if um, a three letter um, identification works now that a 10 letter would, uh, identification would not work because we're not limiting the length here. We're only talking about the height, which remains. Uh, and we have enough budget to have uh, square footage signage budget to have the 10 letters rather than three. So, yeah, I. I've had to represent interests as well, and you always ask for flexibility, and um, sometimes that gets you a little more, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I really think 40 inches is going to be sufficient, but I don't claim to have done a full-on study here. What I would like to think, however, is that if 40 inches proves to seem somehow diminutive, and I really don't expect that. Uh, but I think if that proved to be true, I would join Mr. Barnes in asking council to make an amendment to this approval. Um, so with that, I guess I would like, if, I, if it's a commissioner's prerogative to call the question. Yeah, I think we have, uh, I think it's, it's time, we, we've got a first and a second which is the staff report as submitted, um, but for reducing the maximum height from 48 to 40 inches, um, I think we should go ahead and uh, I agree with you, uh, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, and of course, if that fails, we can return to uh, further discussion. Um, but I wanna make sure that there's not a commissioner that um, feels strongly that this is, this is not an okay way to go um, at this moment. 
Okay, with that, we will then go to a vote, um, trying to remember alphabetical order, Commissioner Barnes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to vote no, thank you. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Commis uh, Vice Chair Harris? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Uh, then I too will vote no for the, I believe, opposite reasons of Commissioner Barnes, but this passes uh, four to two with Commissioner Tate absent. Um, and uh, uh, again, to um, everybody associated with this project, thank you for your diligence. Thank you for your partnership in working through this. And thank you for helping us as a city resolve a question that we needed to resolve here um, and look forward to a, a fantastic and successful conclusion of this project. Thank you very much, commissioners. And really thank you for your support and, and cooperation here as well. Really appreciate it. All right. With that, I will close item F2 and we will move on to item F3 on our agenda this evening. This is a uh, first of two items that are regarding public utility easements abandonment. This is uh, Gray Star, the 141 Jefferson Drive and 18186 Constitution Drive project. This is consideration of the abandonment of public service easements to determine whether the proposed abandonments are consistent with the city's general plan. The request is associated with an approved development of 483 multifamily residential units and associated commercial space. Uh, and with that, let me turn it over to staff. And I believe this is Mr. Hinckley. Do I have that right? That's correct. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chair DeCarty. Uh, I have no further updates on this item. Um, I will be available for questions if needed. And I also have Matt Udoge with the Graystar Project to answer questions as well. All right. Mr. Budoge, welcome. Do you want to uh, make any kind of introductory comment or um, presentation or just available to answer questions? Um, yeah, I'm available to answer questions. Um, but yeah, so I mean, um, my name is Matt Udaj. I'm a director of development with Graystar and applicant for the Menlo Uptown project. Uh, just as a quick background, uh, the project consists of 483 residential units and an urgent care clinic on three parcels. Uh, the project was approved by the Planning Commission in June of 2021 and the City Council in September of 2022. Uh, as part of the development, we plan to underground existing overhead utilities and a new PUE and abandon the existing PUE because it will no longer be needed after we underground the utilities. I don't have a presentation tonight, um, but yes, I am available for questions. So thanks. Terrific. Thanks to you both. Before we go to public comment, do commissioners have any clarifying questions for either um uh staff or or the applicant um commissioner barnes i believe i just heard from the applicant that city council had approved this in september of 2022 uh, the project i think we just got a date discrepancy you're, you're, you're noting that september of 2022 is in the future oh, i'm sorry yeah september barnes? of 2021 21 yes. okay okay mr barnes thank you for that clarification yep terrific any other Clarifying questions before we move to public comment? All right, great. Uh, Mr. Pruder, we are all yours yet again. Thank you again, Chair DeCardi. At this time, we have public comment for this item and members of the public are welcome to press the hand icon on the Zoom interface to uh, be given the opportunity to speak publicly on this particular project item. And uh, if you're calling by phone, you can press star nine. At this time, I don't see any hands raised, but I'm happy to wait a moment. Uh, if you'd like to do that, uh, Chair DeCardi. Sure, let's go ahead and wait a moment. Okay, how is our waiting done? Yes, it is, and I see no hands raised. If you like, you're welcome to close public comment at this time. All right, let's go ahead and do that and bring it back to the virtual dais for any questions, discussions, or motion from uh, commissioners. Commissioner Riggs. 
Yes, I'd like to uh, move approval of the uh, request to vacate. We have a motion to approve as submitted by staff. Commissioner Doe. We'll second that. We have a second from Commissioner Doe. Are there any further questions or comments from commissioners? I'm through the chair. Yes. I just want to clarify, it's a recommendation to the city council, not an approval. Thank you. With that, any further questions or comments from commissioners? I have, a, I have one question, um, I believe for Mr. Hinckley. Um, why do these need to be vacated? In other words, what's the harm in keeping them? So vacating these easements because they're no longer needed. We, we've received no objection letters from utility companies um, that they no longer need these uh, easements. So we would like to turn over complete and full use of those uh, pieces of property back to the applicant and to the property owner. Go ahead, Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, just if I can be of help, uh, there are building restrictions over an easement. So for example, you couldn't put a foundation on an easement uh, you can't put an occupied building. And so it, uh, it limits the use of the property to have easements in place, both current and future. So uh, I think that's the answer you were looking for. Yeah, Thank so- you, Commissioner Riggs. So this is, but this has already been approved. So what we're doing here is we're giving future flexibility for, for redevelopment. Is that what we're doing? I guess to that point, this is back to staff. Uh, so yeah, the building's already approved, but it does give them future flexibility. And I believe this project also wants to take advantage of that area for landscaping trees, which otherwise wouldn't be uh, advisable if there was still an existing easement that somebody could take advantage of. Terrific, okay, super helpful. Any other commissioner questions or comments? All right, let's go ahead and move to a vote. Commissioner Barnes. This is to recommend to city council abandonment. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Vice Chair Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. And I will vote yes as well. So that recommendation passes six to zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Yudosh. Thank you, Mr. Hinckley. We'll now close item F3. Uh, and turn to something similar, which is item F4, public utility easement abandonment. This is um, for Rebecca and Kevin, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing um, Loki, Loki, 248 Oakhurst Place, consideration of the abandonment of a 10 foot wide public utility easement to determine whether the proposed abandonment is consistent with the city's general plan, the request is associated with the development of a single family residence. Um, and to Ms. Sandmeyer, just for clarification, are we once again recommending or in this case, are we approving? Or perhaps I could turn it over to staff. Sorry, Mr. Ring, uh, Ringing. We're uh, recommending uh, to council okay. for approval. Thank you. Uh, and any other introduction or comments uh, for us? Good evening, Chair Bacardi and Commissioners. I do not have anything else to add to the staff report. However, I am available for any questions. Okay. Uh, and uh, is the property owner here at all to uh, present or would like to make a presentation or comment? No, unfortunately they're not. Okay. So any clarifying questions um, of staff from commissioners before we open public comment? All right, seeing none, Mr. Pruder, we are back in your capable hand. I apologize, Mr. Thomas. Yes, just a quick one. So um, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So there's a lot adjacent to this property. And I just wanted to clarify if that, like this would, Im this decision would impact that at all. And if that is um, also an easement or if that is land that is owned by the applicant. Yeah, so uh, pretty much the uh, easement that we're proposing to vacate uh, or recommending is a 
10 foot easement that runs through an existing structure um, from the front of the property and that easement leads to the back of the property and it's a continuous easement into the back of the property going into adjacent properties. So vacating this easement uh, that runs through the structure but not in the back um, will not have any impacts uh, to any um, neighboring properties. Okay, I was particularly concerned about one, um, I think it'd be to the north of the easement that's being abandoned, but just wanted to, to confirm my understanding that that is, um, I guess when I, when I drove by, it was like an empty lot. And so it seemed like it also might be um, under some easement restriction. So just wanted to confirm that there isn't anything there that would be relevant to this decision. No, there isn't anything in there. Uh, we do have no objection letters from all um, utility companies. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Riggs. Pick your on mute. To help clarify the previous question, per perhaps uh, this these two lots that are adjacent used to be three lots, and therefore the uh, map that records the easement shows it at um, a property line, whereas the property line is not there currently. That may be the situation since I've seen um, two different plat maps on this project. Um, perhaps um, the engineering engineer could clarify that. That is correct, um, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, so just, just, uh, let me go over the um, chain of titles. So the subdivision was recorded in 1946. Uh, then in 1947, the owner conveyed the entire subdivision, which would have been blocks one through six, no mention of individual lots uh, to the subdivider who began selling land. Uh, so in October of 1948, Lot number nine was con was conveyed for the very first time, along with half of lot number 10 as part of a grand deed. Um, thus, the combined lot goes back to its very first conveyance uh, directly from the subdivider. Uh, it appears that the buyer wanted a larger lot and the subdivider accommodated by adding half of the lot, half of lot 10. Uh, so if we could just go to... Um, do I have control of this, uh, Vaughn? If we could go to the uh, track maps that I attached to the staff report, uh, specifically pages C4 and C5. Yep. So this is uh, initially what the uh, lot looked like um, per the track map 560 recorded in um, early 1946. As you can see, um, our, the 248 Oakhurst is lot number nine and a 10 foot PUE runs in between the original property line between lot number nine and 10. When the original subdivider uh, gave a portion of lot number 10 to lot number nine, and then the other half to lot number 11. That easement uh, uh, was passed on to lot number nine, which is uh, what you were looking at, uh, what the current existing property lines are. So lot 10 no longer exists. Okay, thank you. We're okay, let's go ahead and turn it to public comment and we can come back for further um, commissioner questions or clarification if need be. So Mr. Pruder, we are back in your hands. Thank you again, uh, Chair Cardi, um, for the planning commissioners and members of the public. Again, uh, public, public comment opportunity for this item. Uh, if you press the hand icon or uh, if you're calling by phone, dialing star nine, um, you'll be able to speak publicly on this particular project item. I don't see any hands at this time, so we could uh, wait for a moment longer if you'd prefer. Yeah, we'll go ahead right. and wait a moment. Uh, 
All right, how'd our wait do? I still see no public commenters uh, at this time. Great, let's go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the virtual dais for any commissioners, comments, questions, or a motion of recommendation. Commissioner Thomas. I, uh, I want a motion to approve. We have a first on a motion to approve, Commissioner Barnes. Second. Second from Commissioner Barnes. Any comments or questions from the commission? Mr. Thomas, you have your hand up. I just want to double check. Okay. All right. Seeing none, we'll then go to a vote. Commissioner Barnes? Yes. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Vice Chair Harris? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. And I'll vote yes as well. So the recommendation passes six to zero. Um, thank you very much for the staff support on this. And we will now close uh, item F4. This includes our public hearing this evening. Uh, we have one more major item, which is under G, a study session. This one is G1. Uh, study session looking at the zoning ordinance and subdivision ordinance amendments associated with implementation of Senate Bill 9. Review and provide feedback on proposed objective standards that would be applicable to two unit housing developments and urban lot splits within single family zoning districts per the requirements of Senate Bill 9. And with that this evening, I believe we are turning this over to Mr. Turner. Commissioner DeCarty, sorry. Yes, Mr. Here. Barnes, I apologize. No, 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 I, I suspect you didn't see that. Um, my preference would be to take a five minute break because we've been at this for two hours, if that's permissible, to kind of step away, uh, get something to drink and come back, if that's okay? Yes, uh, completely permissible. Um, I have it at one minute before nine o'clock, so why don't we reconvene here at five minutes after nine o'clock with the hope that a refreshed and reinvigorated commission will be much more efficient um, going forward. Thank you for the suggestion, Commissioner Barnes. <laughs> we'll reconvene at 9.05.
Uh, for those keeping track at home, I have one minute left until we are going to reconvene. All right, I have 9.05, uh, we at least have a quorum, um, and I will guess that Commissioners Harris and Thomas are within hearing distance. So with that, let's um, uh, commence with uh, item G1 uh, and Associate Planner Turner, um, over to you. Thank you, Chair DeCarty and Commissioners. Um, this is the study session on SB9. Um, <clears throat> I do have a few couple um, housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first, this item was published in the examiner as a public hearing item, um, but was subsequently updated to study session uh, and no action will be taken at tonight's meeting. Um, it is just a study session intended to um, get the public and the commission's feedback on SB9. Um, second, we did receive a few letters of correspondence um, after publication of the staff report. Um, the uh, emails were sent to you, the Planning Commission, earlier this evening, um, and they are attached to the agenda. Um, just to summarize, um, there was some support for a daylight plane that was um, a reduced daylight plane to 30 degrees a bit more restrictive than 45 degrees. Um, there were questions about how um, heritage trees are regulated um, in SB9 developments um, and how the heritage tree ordinance plays in to um, review the projects. Um, a couple clarification items on um, how we regulate stories and lofts. Um, it was a little bit in the context of an ADU, um, but could be applicable here. A um, couple clarifications on the examples that were attached to the staff report. Um, there was some um, support for incentivizing one-store developments over two-store developments um, in SB9 projects. Um, <clears throat> and then a few questions regarding um, the maximum floor area limit, which, uh, all of which we'll get into um, in the presentation. Um, and then finally, uh, Commissioner Riggs pointed out a, um, a typo in the staff report um, in the policy issues. So since uh, uh, SB9 is in effect, um, if the city receives a permit for um, urban lot split or two unit development, uh, it's meant to say, um, if we receive a permit application, um, we need to review it ministerially. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I do have a brief presentation um, going over sort of an overview of SB9, um, a couple example developments, um, and then we'll be open for questions and discussion. So let me share my screen. And hopefully you all can, can see this without my notes. Okay, so getting started, um, our agenda for today, as I mentioned, I'll go over some general information um, and a few state mandated standards that are included in SB9. Uh, we'll go over the recommended mental park uh, objective standards. Um, and then we'll walk through a couple of sample developments um, that were put together by our consulting architect, Arnold Mamorella, who's here tonight, um, if any architectural questions arise. So general SB9 information. Um, at a state level, the intent of SB9 is to help alleviate 
um, statewide housing crisis, um, both in terms of number of housing units available and, and the affordability um, of ownership units. Um, it's intended to provide another strategy that cities can use uh, for producing housing units um, and provide additional ownership opportunities in single family neighborhoods um, by way of the urban lot split, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, as far as applicability, SB9 went into effect in January of this year. Um, so we are um, able to receive applications for urban lot splits and, and urban duplex projects. Um, it uh, applies to all single family zoned properties um, within cities uh, with few exception, uh, exceptions, things like if the properties are in coastal zones, wetlands, fire, um, safety, uh, severity zones, protected habitats, um, those would be exempt from SB9. Um, many of these don't apply to Menlo Park, um, with the exception we do have some single family properties in flood zones. Um, however, since the city has um, standards in place that meet FEMA guidelines for um, flood zone development, uh, SB9 would still apply to um, to those properties in the, in the flood zone. Um, <clears throat> SB9 does um, establish a few very basic requirements that the city is um, required to, to allow. Um, so the city must allow ministerial approval of subdivision of single family lots. Uh, it's called urban lot splits in the bill. Um, we must approve uh, a minute, we must do ministerial approval of up to two units per single family lot. Um, so in the case of an urban lot split, two units per lot. Um, so up to four units where, um, where previously a single, single family dwelling unit could have been uh, built. Um, it establishes a minimum lot size of 1,200 square feet. Uh, cities are allowed to um, implement a smaller lot size, um, but we have to allow um, 1,200 square feet as the minimum, so long as um, the maximum split between the new lots, um, it's a 60-40 split in lot area. Um, so you can have one 1,200 square foot lot and then one um, 6,000 square foot lot because the discrepancy would be too large. Um, it limits cities to being able to require only up to um, one parking space per unit with certain exemptions, um, similar to ADU exemptions if the property is within half a mile of a high quality transit corridor or a major transit stop. Um, and then SB9 goes a little bit further. It says that there's a a car share vehicle within one block of, um, of the property, uh, it would be exempt from, from parking. Um, and then finally, SB9 is intended to be a owner initiated, an owner initiated process. Um, it's not intended for developers to purchase single family properties, split them, develop them and leave. Um, there is a requirement that the owner of the property doing the lot split um, submit an affidavit uh, saying that they intend to live in one of the units as their primary dwelling for a minimum of three years. Um, so as you can see, there's there's only a few um, few items that from a development standard perspective, the SB9 um, mandates after that cities are allowed to implement their own objective development standards as long as they do not preclude the development of, of two units of at least 800 square feet. Um, as a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, staff is still working on um, fleshing out a few of these development regulations. Um, we are looking for planning commission to provide some input. Um, we planted some seeds in there, but obviously um, the discussion is not limited to those seats. So we'll start with uh, floor area limit and building coverage. Um, 
So as a, as a rule under SB9, we can't limit the floor area to less than 1600 square feet. Um, have to be able to allow the two 800 square foot units. So um, we would be looking to establish a, um, a 50, a 56% of an FAR of 0.56 on lots less than 5,000 square feet in area. Currently under um, zoning regulations, there is no um, maximum floor area limit established for lots less than 5,000 square feet. Um, the floor area limit is established by the planning commission through a use permit process. Um, under SB9, we aren't allowed to require uh, discretionary approval for, for that. So we need to come up with um, a maximum FAL for lots less than 5,000 square feet, which um, could potentially happen with urban lot splits. Uh, we could end up with more um, lots less than 5,000 square feet. Um, so historically, um, when use permits have been applied for by an applicant, um, staff has been willing to recommend a 0.56 uh, FAR for these lots. Um, it is taken as the sort of minimum ratio of um, like a standard 5,000 square foot lot um, where the floor area limit is 2,800 square feet. Um, that equals 0.56. So a little bit of a math going on there. <clears throat> um, as far as building coverage, um, for one story developments, we would uh, establish the building coverage at the FAL plus 200 square feet. This would allow um, people to develop the, the full amount of square footage for the two units, um, but give a little wiggle room for things like um, covered patios or um, pergolas and things of that sort. Um, for two story, properties uh, or two-story developments, um, we would establish a, a 1,000 square feet or 30%, um, whichever is, is greater. So a couple of topics for discussion. Um, is 0.56 an appropriate FAR for small lots? Um, should we limit FAL on lots less than 5,000 square feet to um, the bare minimum 1,600 square feet? Um, and should we consider an FAL um, other than that of the underlying zoning district um, for lots 5,000 square feet or greater? <clears throat> so um, this is a bit new from Inland Park. Um, we recommend a um, maximum unit size. Um, this is to promote smaller, more affordable units um, to, to get at the spirit of SB9 and what it uh, is trying to accomplish at a state level. Um, <clears throat> so for lots uh, less with less than 2,000 square feet of available floor area, um, the maximum unit size would just be um, the max FAL minus 800 square feet. This uh, ensures that the two units of at least 800 square feet could be um, built, um, but gives a little bit of flexibility for, for one slightly larger unit. Um, for lots uh, with a floor area limit of greater than 2,000 square feet, um, we um, propose sort of similar to the lot area of a 60-40 split where one of the units can, um, the max size for one of the units would be 60% of the available floor area. Um, so then the, the second unit could utilize the rest of the 40%. Um, this gives a little bit of flexibility um, so you don't end up with you know, each unit looking the, the same, same size. Um, there's room for some creativity in design. <clears throat> um, these would be the objective. <laughs> design standards, um, there would be a um, stipulation, a uh, provision in the ordinance um, stating that if you wanted to um, 
modify the objective standards, uh, you can do so through a use permit, um, similar to the ADU laws. Um, so somebody could propose to use all of the floor area in um, available to them in, in a single unit, um, but they would need to go through use permit process and get the approval of the planning commission. Um, so a couple topics for discuss it, discussion. Uh, should we include a maximum unit size? Um, should another maximum unit size be considered uh, if, if we do want to include this provision? The setbacks and step backs. Um, the side and rear would be four feet, uh, which is required by state law. Um, the front we would keep as a, a the underlying zoning district in pretty much um, every zoning district that's 20 feet uh, in most cases, uh, with the exception that the front property line and a new panhandle lot um, could be subject to the um, four foot setback. Um, it wouldn't have to be 20 feet from the, the front, the rear property line of the front lot. Um, we would allow uh, zero lot line developments. So um, two or more residences that are seemingly connected, um, technically separate structures with firewall uh, in the middle, um, but it, it looks like a single um, structure. Um, this would only be at new interior property lines. Um, so say, the middle um, lot line in a 50-50 lot split. <clears throat> um, we do propose a step back requirement um, where the second story is required to step back to the minimum uh, side and rear step backs of the underlying zoning district. Um, we added this to maintain a familiar level of privacy um, and massing in single family districts. So a few topics for discussion. Um, <clears throat> should we require a second story step back? Um, if so, should it be greater or smaller than the recommended step back? And should we allow um, zero lot line developments to be permitted? <clears throat> um, as far as parking, um, we, as I mentioned, the state mandates, um, we can't mandate more than one parking space per unit. So we would allow um, the parking space to be uncovered. Uh, one space per unit parking would be allowed in the front and side setbacks, um, <clears throat> but it may not be in tandem with other required parking spaces. Um, if somebody wanted to provide a garage, um, it would count towards their um, floor area. Um, so a couple topics for discussion. Um, should a requirement to limit one curb cut per project be included? Um, and should we, should the, the parking be required to be covered? <clears throat> um, building massing. So um, we would keep the height limit 28 feet, which is consistent with um, the existing height limit on most single family um, properties. Um, the daylight plan we would establish at uh, 12 feet, six inches in at a 45 degree angle from the four foot property line. Um, the height and angle is consistent with um, daylight plane for one story developments, um, but we would keep the, the daylight plane consistent for one and two story developments uh, under SB9. <clears throat> um, this may have the effect of shifting second floors towards the center of the lot um, and may, um, so second stories may need to be stepped back further than, than the minimum um, for the underlying zoning district. Uh, a couple topics for discussion. Should a different height limit be considered? Um, and then should a different daylight plane standards be considered here? <clears throat> um, privacy and architectural design. Um, so since SB9 projects are no longer subject to discretionary review by the planning commission, um, 
these these standards are based on um, comments historically received by um, by the planning commission um, on use permit projects, things like um, window material, gridding patterns, um, being true simulated true divided light, um, stucco being smooth stucco. Um, <clears throat> we often hear a minimum of sill height of three feet on the second floor being um, acceptable to help protect privacy of neighbors. Um, and then obscuring class um, or, or having higher sill heights in as opposed to say stair landings. Um, so again, since, um, since these projects would be um, approved ministerially, these types of architectural and privacy um, standards would need to be codified um, for, for us to be able to regulate them. Um, so a couple topics for discussion. Um, should material standards be included in the ordinance? If so, are there additional items to consider? Um, are there other privacy standards that should be considered here? <clears throat> um, so we do have a couple example developments. They were included as attachments to the staff report. Um, I just want to be very clear, these are hypothetical developments and, and are for illustrative purposes only. Um, they're based on development standards um, presented on, on sort of typical lots we see in, in Menlo Park. Um, and like I said, there are still items that are being sorted out, um, this, um, which I'll point out. <clears throat> so this first one, um, this is kind of a typical lot we see in the Bellhaven area. It's an R1U zone property, um, 50 by 100 square feet. Um, so a couple things to point out here. Um, Panhandle lots on these smaller lots are infeasible um, given access requirements for, uh, for fire um, and transportation. Um, the daylight plan is, is more restrictive. Um, <clears throat> so here we have a zero lot line development where the um, second story is pushed in further than, um, than when you required under the zoning. Um, and then um, there are four spaces, four parking spaces along the front of the property uh, with two larger curb cuts. <clears throat> this uh, is similar to the first example, um, just within a um, sort of single building. So the, each building in the, in the two properties are connected. Um, and there's a zero lot line between the two um, adjacent properties, but similar um, restrictions as far as the daylight plane is concerned, uh, sort of forcing the, the mass of the building towards the center of the lot. Um, this is, um, <clears throat> what would be considered an actual standard uh, R1U property. The other two were technically substandard R1U lots. Um, so this would be standard 65 uh, by 150. Um, this utilizes a 60-40 lot split. So the properties are different sizes. Um, and we do have a panhandle uh, development here. Um, like I said, we, we used a 15 foot uh, driveway here. Um, we are in discussion with the fire district and, and transportation. Um, a 20 foot panhandle may be required. Um, so this might change slightly, um, but I, it would still probably be feasible here to do a, a panhandle lot. Um, and then here, the, uh, the rear step back requirement um, is really evident on, on unit four, um, forces the second story towards the middle of the, the property. Um, and then along the sides, again, the, the daylight plane is um, uh, more restrictive and, and forces the second story towards the middle of the, um, 
the properties in, in both cases. This uh, would be a standard R1S lot. So um, this is 90 by 115. <clears throat> um, here we, we have another side-by-side -side lot split, 50-50. Uh, um, here you can really see the, um, the unit size. This one uh, utilized the 60-40 lot split, or sorry, 60-40 unit size split. So we have um, two units on each lot of, of varying sizes um, with varying degrees of, of step back requirements um, along the rear. Um, this one also has two um, driveway curb cuts, one on each um, property to allow for um, the parking requirements to be met. And finally, um, this is again the same 90 by 115 R1S lot. Um, this one is what we call the bungalow court development, it has a single shared driveway down the center. Um, there would be access easements on either side of the, um, the properties. Um, then this one um, has uh, sort of units of varying designs and, and sizes as well. <clears throat> um, apologies for my, my raspiness. I've got a little bit of a cough, uh, but that does conclude my presentation for, um, for the moment. We do have, um, I believe, Abby, our senior engineer, still on. Um, in our consulting arborist, Arnold Mamrella, um, in case there are um, questions about the architecture. Um, unfortunately, we can have a uh, representative from our city attorney's office here tonight, um, but I will try to answer legal questions as best I can um, with the disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer. Um, so there may be some, some questions um, that I need to flag. Um, discussion with the city attorney's office. All right. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you to staff for being here. Um, I'm eager to open it to public comment. I think there are a lot of people who have attended this evening waiting for this moment, so they've been patient. Um, but I also want to make sure that if there are any clarifying questions from commissioners at this time that we can get those answered. So before opening for public comment, any clarifying questions? Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, I, I can't remember the phrase for the well-served transit corridor. Um, can we define that um, for um, commissioners and for anyone um, tuned in and listening? Is that uh, where that does not include a train, for example, where it depends on a county bus system? Uh, is that based on the bus interval? Um, for example, past my neighborhood in suburban park and flood park, um, there's a bus that runs every 30 minutes and uh, nobody considers that to be a uh, well-served transit corridor. Is the interval 15 minutes, is it 10? Uh, do we have that clarity? Right. So the um, the high quality transit corridor um, and the major transit stop, those are both defined um, in various state codes. Um, so a high quality transit corridor is um, a corridor with fixed bus route service with um, intervals no longer than 15 minutes during peak commute hours. And then a major transit stop is uh, an existing rail or bus rapid transit station, uh, the intersection of two or more major bus routes with a frequency of service interval of 15 minutes or less during the morning and afternoon peak commute periods. Um, and then um, there's a separate part about ferries, uh, ferry service that um, doesn't exactly apply to Menlo Park. Uh, but yeah, so for the most part, 15 minute intervals in the peak um, commute periods. Um, and we would, we would coordinate with the transportation division to see whether or not um, a certain bus stop or certain corridor um, qualifies as one of these uh, major transit stop or, or quality transit corridor. 
um, for purposes of, of parking exemptions. And then I had an additional question. <clears throat> this is sort of a prompt. Uh, during the discuss discussion after um, the public comment, it might be helpful to have an image from our code of the daylight plane, since that's something that is particularly challenging for people to understand. So maybe if we could pull that up within the next 10 minutes, that'd be very helpful for uh, subsequent discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Again, clarifying questions before public comment. Commissioner Barnes. Thank you for that. I'm trying to understand lot coverage as in the context of percentages. And um, I'm not able to do that. And I, I have a suspicion why in terms of how this is set up, but what would you, what happens? Let me ask it this way. What happens to lot coverage ratios on a 5,000 square foot lot in the Willows? How, how would you answer that? Um, it, de it would depend on whether the development is a, a one or a two story development. Um, just for, um, I guess, purposes of examples, if we go, if we look at the current zoning standards um, in R1U, R1S, 35% um, was would be the maximum for a two-story development. Um, and then 40%, there's a sliding scale um, between a lot size of 7,000 square feet and 10,500 square feet. But if you have, um, let's say a, a lot of 6,000 square feet, um, your building coverage would be 40% with the, a single story development. So um, if we take a, 6,000 square foot lot, for example, and apply the SB9 um, standards, the lot coverage ratio for a, a one store development increases um, quite a bit. You'd have 2,800 square feet um, of lot coverage plus the 200 um, under SB9, so 3,000. Basically, fifty percent lot coverage for an FD nine one story development, um, where if you go six thousand times 0.4, um, twenty four hundred would have been the max under regular zone um, existing zoning standards. Um, it gets more restrictive though for two story developments. Um, where you go from 35% down to 30%. So it would depend on, on the type of development. And then that, okay, I'll come back to that, thank you. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead, Mr. Pruder, on open public comment. All right, thank you again, Chair DeCarty at this time. The public comment for this item, members of the public uh, can <clears throat> use the hand icon in their Zoom interface or press star nine if they are using the phone tonight for this uh, meeting. And we have one commenter at this time, so I could uh, have them uh, begin their comment. Thank you, Chair DeCarty. Uh, the first commenter we have is uh, a person by the name of Adina Levin. Adina Levin. Um, I'm going to unmute your phone and uh, sorry, your account, and you'll be able to speak and uh, provide your public comment. You'll have three minutes to speak. And again, um, I apologize for the interruption in advance, but I will remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining and no time remaining for your comment. And if you could please provide your name and your jurisdiction at the start of the comment, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Um. Hello, good evening, um, planning commissioners and staff. My name is Adina Levin. I live in Menlo Park and um, just wanted to uh, start this off 
by um, saying that um, I think that um, SB9 is a, a, a good idea as one small slice of the set of solutions that are uh, potentially helpful in providing um, more different kinds of housing options. Um, in a city and in a region where we have a big shortage of housing and also a real shortage on what kinds of housing are generally available. And um, so um, with that, I, I would um, like to share with the Planning Commission that in terms of all of these different decisions and options, I would like to see as a few restrictions as possible in um, ways that enable um, uh, homeowners to take advantage of SB9 to provide um, more homes on their uh, property. Um, uh, first of all, I think that requiring a homeowner to make this uh, uh, site be uh, below, uh, for more below market rate is potentially a poison pill for uh, homeowners. And so please do not do that. And then other limitations in terms of square footage and you know new and different architectural refinements that are different from the other uh, standards that we have in the same neighborhoods, um, you know extra special setback requirements, extra spe special lot width requirements. Like please constrain this as uh, little as possible because what SB nine can potentially do is enable a variety and the more we try to restrict it, the less housing we're gonna get. And I think I heard that maybe there's been only one application in our entire city. And so the least restrictive we can be, the more likely we will be able to get uh, more homes that we need. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We do have a second commenter at this time. So I will introduce that person now. Uh, their name is Kelsey Baines. And uh, I'm going to unmute your microphone at this time. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment, that'd be greatly appreciated. You'll be given three minutes to speak. And again, I will let you know when you have 30 seconds and no seconds remaining in your comment. Uh, you may begin and the clock will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Kelsey Baines. I am a volunteer lead with uh, Peninsula for Everyone. Uh, and we advocate for an inclusive and sustainable region um, in terms of both housing and transportation. Um, so I don't live in Menlo Park, but I advocate throughout the region. Um, and I'm really passionate about this particular policy because Peninsula for Everyone um, campaign to help pass SB9, which I think will prove to be a popular policy as it will help families uh, meet their housing needs. Um, so I spent most of the pandemic um, living with my partner and his mom who um, was in her 80s or is in her, her 80s, I should say. Um, and it, we lived in a four bedroom house and we would often talk about how nice it would be if we could just split the house in, in half um, by extending a wall and we could create two units. Um, but that was illegal to do because one of those units would be too big to be an ADU. Um, it would be over 800 square feet. Um, so it was impossible um, with the current ADU policies in Palo Alto where I lived. So I hope that as we uh, are implementing these important policy changes, uh, we can help um, support homeowners in making this change because it is an expensive thing to do. Um, so focusing on reducing costs and making it clear what we do want to see rather than adding these onerous new restrictions. Um, and so really think about maximizing flexibility for homeowners and making it feasible for them to make these changes because it really is important to people in the community to be able to have private spaces, family sized spaces, people are really struggling and we need to provide families with options to meet their housing needs across their lifespan. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. I, I agree with what Adina said in terms of the specific policies, but um, yeah, I would just think about making this possible for families in your community to actually use this policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. 
We have another commenter at this time, one additional commenter I see, uh, with their name being Nisha Selim. Um, at this time, I'm going to allow you to unmute your microphone. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment. You'll have three minutes, and I'll let you know when you have 30 minutes and no, sorry, 30 seconds and no uh, remaining seconds for your comment. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. My name is Misha. I live in the Allied Arts neighborhood of Menlo Park. Um, I live on an R2 lot and my street is almost all R2 lots. Um, lots of young families, everyone really likes it. It's kind of what I would refer to as gentle density where um, if you drive down the street, a lot of the uh, homes are separate. They're still single family individual structures, but there's just two of them on one lot instead of one and they share a driveway. So if you drive down the street, it doesn't look like a scary, you know, super dense neighborhood like a lot of opponents of SB9 are afraid of. And given that we're right next to Stanford, um, it totally makes sense to have at least that much density. So if I go further deeper into outlet arts on Bay Laurel, for example, you will see massive homes going up uh, today, you know, huge construction crews building giant two story homes with a pool and a pool house and everything like that, right across the creek from Stanford. Um, it doesn't make sense. And so my comment is kind of in line with the previous two commenters. Um, please don't put any owner's restrictions on this uh, approval. And I do think that requiring one of the units to be affordable will basically make it infeasible to build. Um, but in addition to that, I would challenge the commission to find a way to encourage these types of developments over just a larger single family home. Like if you think of Thomas James and what they're doing and what other folks are doing, buying smaller homes and just basically blowing up the square footage as much as they can given the lot coverage restrictions uh, to make it a bigger home. Wouldn't we rather have someone do, you know, turn that home into two homes? Uh, that I think would be much better. And if there's any way to incentivize doing that rather than just building a better, a bigger home, uh, that would be great. So I don't have any specific suggestions, but I would appreciate if you could keep, keep that in mind through your discussions. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, Chair DeCardi, I do not see any additional hands raised. We could wait a moment longer if you'd like, or we could close the public comment period. Let's go ahead and wait. People have been uh, with us this far. I wanna make sure everybody has a chance to comment if they would like. All right, since I'm viewing the attendee list, I am now 0 for 5 and waiting this evening for additional comments. I believe, Mr. Pruder, <laughs> you want to confirm that? Yes, I believe the streak still lives, so no All additional right. commenters at this time. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Uh, we'll bring this back to the commission. Uh, and again, as a reminder, this is a study session. It's not a public hearing. We are not voting. We are not making a recommendation. Uh, so it is to provide feedback. We are welcome to provide feedback in any way, but we did have the six areas of specific feedback that were in the staff report uh, and that Mr. Pruder outlined. Um, as um, just a reminder, it's around um, floor area levels. Number one, number two, maximum unit size. Number three, setbacks. Number four, parking. Number five, building massing. And number six, privacy and architectural design. Uh, so I know that the staff would appreciate comments directed at any or all of those. And with that, I will turn it over to any commissioner to start us off. See Vice Chair Harris. Thank you. I was waiting a little bit, but I thought I'd go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a number of points. Um, 
I would agree with most of the callers so far. Uh, I, I too do not want to make it onerous, extra onerous for property owners um, to be able to build under SB9. Um, the first is require, I am not interested in requiring affordable units. You know, mandating affordability requirements for these units just means that a lot of units aren't going to be built because homeowners are not going to be okay with taking a huge lot uh, loss on these units. Now, I wouldn't be adverse to an incentive program for making one or more units of being affordable, but I don't think it should be mandatory. <clears throat> um, I also disagree with requiring architectural design elements that are different than other single family home requirements. Um, I don't think they should diverge from the current requirements on single family development. Uh, and if they do, it just feels very unfair to me. Um, a lot of these uh, families are gonna be young families just starting out. And I know that when we redid our house, we couldn't afford wood windows for all of our windows. And so we do have three vinyl windows. Um, and so, you know, do I wish they were wood windows? I sure do, but I don't, I don't want to prevent somebody from building an SB9 because they can't afford all of the highest end finishes. So I disagree with that. Um, I don't, I also don't wanna discriminate on lot width. Um, I think that probably most of the lots we have in Menlo Park are 50 um, feet or more. However, if there are some that are 48, like the one that we saw earlier tonight, I wouldn't want to make it so that they were not allowed to take advantage of this rule. And perhaps if we're not happy with the narrowness, we could have another a different, less onerous rule, such as, hey, if the lot width is less than 50 feet, then the lot should be split capped at 50-50, not 40-60. Something else to just make it a little bit easier on the homeowner. Um, I'm concerned about a step back for the second floor um, because if the first floor is at four feet and then the second floor is at 20 feet, that feels difficult to me. Um, so I'm not, I don't feel that comfortable with the step back. Um, I had one more. Uh, oh yeah, I, I'm not interested in limiting the square footage of the units. Um, I think limiting the unit size or FAL or other aspects of the building, it's not, it's just not a good affordability strategy. Um, fewer units are just going to be built overall. If we, if we make the restrictions, um, we're going to just really limit the property owner's opportunities. Um, so I think that is, I'll just stop there with those five points. Thank you. Vice Chair Harris. Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I have to agree with uh, a point that uh, the Vice Chair makes, uh, and that's regarding the windows. Um, although I was one of those um, up until recently that opposed vinyl windows, for example. Um, vinyl windows have rather come a long way and I just bought 16 of them. Um, what's important is that the profile came down from where vinyl windows for some reason needed about a three inch profile. They're down now below two inches and from more than five feet away, they look virtually the same. Um, I'd say their main uh, detraction is what they look like up close from inside, which isn't really our purview. Um, so I would change the wording on the, <clears throat> on the um, window restriction. I would recommend that rather than uh, specifying material, we would specify a uh, profile size. Um, however, <clears throat> beyond that, um, regarding this, um, this staff report for the study session, I have to say, I am really impressed with the amount of work that went through here, uh, how much thought is involved, um, how carefully things are thought out. Um, before I had read through this, I made a quick outline of points that I thought uh, 
I, I would say maybe um, uh, items that we want to make sure we address and opportunities that we might take. And um, pretty much my whole list got checked off um, by this work. So I thank you to our city staff and to Mr. Maranella, who I'm sure um, uh, was a key driver on all of this. Um, so I'm just gonna go down my list, which uh, occurred somewhat randomly, but uh, I guess it's a big topic that's up front here. I absolutely support the um, uh, requirement of a BMR for um, multiple units. And I'll have to make an observation. The support for SB9 and SB10 is almost entirely from those who have sympathy for those who cannot afford Bay Area prices. In other words, they're looking for lower cost housing. If we're going to encourage people to build 800 square foot apartments that they're going to rent for $3,500 a month, we have not achieved anything like the uh, affordability issue. We've just given an opportunity for people to grow their estates. And I don't have anything against that, but I don't think I wanna confuse the overall goals, the goals that most of us would have seen as positive in SB9 with what a, a simple production of more real estate um, does. So um, frankly, I would love to see not only the BMR requirement as drafted, but I'd like to pick up on the vice chair's suggestion of also including a carrot. Perhaps the city is willing to use some of its BMR funds to encourage uh, an additional lower priced unit um, by offering uh, some kind of a subsidy. We certainly give subsidies to uh, nonprofit organizations some of which build at over half a million dollars per unit. Uh, so we can uh, consider doing this on an individual basis. Um, I'll just go through some of the staff items. The requirement for an owner occupancy for three years, absolutely. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, the suggestion of using 56% uh, as the FAL for smaller lots, I think that's a wonderful solution. I remember um, uh, the number of, uh, it, it's only been a handful of smaller lots that have come to us and we have wondered, well, how do we approve 2,800 square feet on a 3,500 square foot lot if that's all you can build on 5,000? And yet we did that, I think, more than once. Um, so that I think is well done. Um, the parking concept of, uh, one space per unit, except on a bona fide transit corridor. I've got to support that. Um, as much as we would like to free ourselves of cars, unless you're on a transit corridor and there aren't a lot of them in Menlo Park, simply you need a car. And the lower your income, the more likely you need and depend on a car. Um, that's just truth. Um, uh, the zero lot line idea as an alternative is brilliant. Um, it, I think it works for all parties. It means that um, both, uh, that the two lots uh, can eliminate uh, a void space in between if they're so willing. Um, and it means for the rest of us that you drive by one structure in an R1 neighborhood rather than two. Uh, it's effectively a duplex with a property line, which is a great idea. Um, the minimum lot dimensions, I think, are a good idea. They're, I don't think they're highly restrictive. I think they're reasonable. Uh, I think the set, second floor setback is an excellent idea. Um, most of what people in R1 neighborhoods are concerned about is having a two-story building it's four foot from their fence. Um, that's quite an impact on your backyard. It's also quite an impact on your residence uh, at 
because side windows are frequently bedroom windows. And even if they weren't, do you really want a two-story right next to it when you probably stretched quite a bit to get into an R1 neighborhood to begin with? Uh, the lowering of the daylight plane, um, I guess I'm a little self-serving when I support that because that's what we based um, my neighborhood's overlay on. We lowered, I think it was to 12 foot six um, from the 196 that was citywide <clears throat> at the time. And uh, daylight plane answers a lot of concerns for people. And then it leaves an envelope inside that day, daylight plane for the applicant homeowner to work with. Um, so uh, frankly, I would not be opposed to a lower daylight plane. And by the way, I just um, completed a second floor ADU in San Mateo where their limitation on ADUs is plate height and it's 16 feet. <clears throat> um, 16 feet is not enough to have two eight foot floors, a foundation and a floor structure in between. But um, as uh, Commissioner Barnes knows, one can lower an outside wall uh, as long as the ceiling rises uh, within and still have a space that feels like a, a good volume. Um, uh, so uh, I'm not at all concerned that the daylight plane uh, will uh, be draconian. Um, and then finally, I do have one concern about the proposals, uh, which include um, uh, parking in the front setback. Um, schemes, uh, I believe they were 1A and 1B, count on putting four cars across the front property line. That's certainly something that people who scraped and saved and got indebted in order to get into an R1 zone were not looking forward to. Um, indeed, in Menlo Park, as a town, as a community, we are based on and we grew based on trying to keep cars more or less out of sight so that we can see front porches and trees um, and uh, more of a sense of, um, uh, of a village that um, those before us had in mind and worked hard to create. So I would like to suggest one revision and that is to reduce front parking to no more than two spaces in, uh, in 50 feet of uh, frontage. Um, other than that, I am very much supportive and appreciative of what has been done here. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Other commissioners? Commissioner Barnes. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, would it be possible to pull up, have staff, uh, Mr. Turner, pull up example 1A? Yeah, that's fine. And, and you can interact directly with staff. Commissioner Barnes, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Turner, would you be so kind as to pull up the, the example 1A? Yes. Okay, so I will walk into this discussion. Uh, Mr. Turner, your, your slides were great and there were a lot of questions on there. And I, I consider myself somewhat versed in this stuff, but there's a, there's a lot to go through. And I'm not, um, I'm not gonna use my time specifically to address some of the uh, more specific underlying pieces, but I'm gonna start macro. And I will say that, and I'll say this for the, you know, to be on public record, that I am dumbfounded that this example 1A 
would represent anything that we would do uh, in uh, in a neighborhood with a 5,000 square foot lot. Um, the reference was to Bellhaven in terms of 5,000 square feet. Uh, this is my street right here with 5,000 square feet lot. And you know, we, some of the, in the initial slides, we were, the premise of SB9 was around home ownership. And in fact, it, it, there are no, you know, there's no guarantees that these are gonna be condos. There's no guarantees that these are gonna be anything other than rental parking. And to turn a 5,000 square foot lot that has a single family home on it to a lot that has four car spaces in front and four units uh, and eradicates uh, on a multifamily rental project and eradicates landscaping and eradicates trees um, and, and, and contemplates this as a uh, as something that is done to a 5,000 square foot lot, but yet when we look at the other, other lots, so we had, you know, we had a public comment about gentle density in allied arts. Well, sure, when you're on a 10,000 square foot lot and you take a flag lot and you put multiple units on it, uh, it works a lot different than when you're on a 5,000 square foot lot. So my, um, you know, my, my response is this is, this is, this is prejudicial to folks uh, who live on 5,000 square foot lot to have four rental units jammed in there. Now, SB9 is a state regulation. So the question becomes, you know, what do we do at a Menlo Park level to accommodate what we have to accommodate from a state level, but yet, um, <laughs> but yet not destroy our neighborhoods? And I am all for multifamily housing. Uh, I am all for density where density uh, works. I'm all for around transit stops, uh, tremendous density, but taking a neighborhood and, 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 and effectively concreting it and effectively hardscaping uh, an entire 5,000 square foot lot. Uh, if you look at this, the patio, and then the front and the sides, there's gonna be nothing left of these lots. So, you know, under a different cover, uh, you know, this, this proposal can be looked at, whether it's you know, starting with the, a very simple reduction of parking spaces in front and then going to covered spaces and figuring out how it is that preserving the setbacks um, and doing multiple things that, um, <laughs> that does not destroy people's neighborhoods that are on 5,000 square foot lots by jamming in four re uh, rental units in there. And it's, you know, we have, uh, it's just unfair on so many levels. Um, and, you know, we have a, we have, and if it's going to happen, right, if there's going to be parts of it, we have a policy where when a particular when something gets upzoned, the, the whole concept of upzoning is, for instance, in the you know the M2 area, right? You upzone, so there is value created for the homeowner. So value gets created for the homeowner, therefore the homeowner has to contribute, uh, you know, has to provide some of that upzone value back to the community. How are we doing with this? Are we looking at BMR units? Are we looking at other ways that um, these upzone units, which uh, you know, could be bought by a speculator or could be owned by someone over a long period of time that is has their property tax frozen by Prop 13 and then enjoys continued benefits from this without contributing to the community. Um, I'll stop there. But this is, this is, this is, there's nothing about this uh, to like from a single family residential homeowner on 5,000 square feet lots in the Willows, zero. And I'll leave it at that. Other commissioner comments or, Commissioner Barnes, you still have your hand up. I just wanna make sure you're. No, thank you. Okay. 
Commissioner Riggs? Yeah, I, I see that I forgot to specifically support the architectural design standards. I only commented on uh, changing the windows, but um, I'd like to note, particularly in context of what Ms. Levin said um, on, uh, in public comment, that this is an opportunity for us finally to put perhaps to test some design standards that a lot of us have believed for 20 years should be part of our overall city standards. And if we can put them in place here, I would say that is not in order to <clears throat> um, single out these units for more restrictions, but I think rather as a template that I hope will be found acceptable um, when and if we can finally put standards before city council for residential in general. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Other commissioner comments? Uh, well, people are thinking and in the interest of time, um, I'll try to add in. I think one of the hardest things, a couple hard things for me on this is, I want a straight line to more affordable housing in Menlo Park. That will make us a stronger and better community. Um, and as several of the letters and the commenters and some of the commissioners this evening have pointed out, this is not a straight line to affordable housing. And uh, making it a straight line to affordable housing would keep it from happening absent, I think Vice Chair Harris said this well, absent incentives. So I would support incentives uh, for sure to try to make uh, these types of developments affordable. But I believe that from an economic standpoint, the premise here is to um, provide more housing at any level possible, um, more densely in our community, because it will impact the overall market, that there will be a ripple effect. And I think in a, in a market that's quasi not functioning well, you could see that happening. It's just such a shame because in the market around here, it is so distorted that that's going to be a long journey. But nonetheless, I think the principle that is behind the comments from several, beginning with Ms. Levin's comment, that I would agree with, the point is to actually support and encourage these getting built. Um, and so everything that we can do to reduce the restrictions to streamline and to support these happening, I think is good for us as a community. So that would be an overall point on this. On a couple specific pieces, um, I do have a question based on my observation that we have that is a little bit like this, which is how ADUs have been um, put in place. And it is a similar kind of deal. We've, we've approved ADUs that have been presented to us as a planning commission that would be for family members to stay in. Um, so, you know, not affordable housing for anybody else. But again, the same principle, that family member now gets to stay there and they won't be living someplace else, putting pressure on the market in other places. But I think we've also seen some that have been utilized not to uh, extend any more people living in the house, but to um, take advantage of some of the streamlining or changes in setbacks. And so my question for, um, for staff is, what's the worst case scenario in the other direction? So I've got a 10,000 foot lot and as I think you said in an answer to a question, um, you can put more stuff on a lot um, by dividing it and putting four units there. So one of the examples you had was sort of this single building that had top and bottom four units with that zero lot line. How does that look for me in terms of getting more square footage of stuff to be able to live in by going this route, but actually just having my single family live in there as opposed to actually having 
three other units? What precludes that from happening? Yeah, so it's to staff, anybody on staff, that'd be great. Uh, why don't I jump in um, Great. help Chris on this one? So I think on the um, larger lots, you are gonna get a significant additional square footage if you go through the lot split. And uh, then on top of that building, the four units. So in, in that case, for example, in one of our uh, 3A and 3, 3B ex examples, you're probably going from an underlying lot of, of um, underlying floor area limit of 3,600 square feet approximately, which you could have an 800 square foot ADU on top of that. So that would be 4,400 square feet to with the SB9, you could build 5,600 square feet. So that's a 1,200 square foot additional amount of floor area that you can build on that lot by going through the SB9 process. Conversely, which would possibly uh, respond a little bit to Com Commissioner Barnes' concerns is that on a very small lot, it's just the opposite, that on the 55,000 square foot lot that you, you subdivide it in, into two lots, you actually can build less under the SP9 than you could by just taking that lot and building a house plus an ADU. So example, on, on a very small lot, you, you, you will have um, 3,200 squ square feet under the SP9 for up, up to four units. But say that, that 5,000 squ square foot lot, you just build um, a house, 2,800 squ square feet plus an ADU, 800 square feet, you'd have 3,600 square feet, which is 400 more square feet. So I think there's some subtleties to this where you, you will benefit one way or the other, depending on, on, the, on, on the size of your lot. I'm not sure if that answers your, your question fully, but that's um, something that your question sort of um, suggested to, to me of how to answer. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so just to go one step further, so I've got a large lot. Um, I now can have a lot more square footage. Can I configure those four units so that that square footage is easily convertible into stuff that looks like a massive single family house that my large single family would enjoy? It depends on what the city allows. Uh, the state does not require you to, to allow anything other than uh, two 800 square foot units but since you already have an, ex an existing floor area limit there, you could build up to that floor area limit. So you could have one large house and then one, one, one small house. In that case, you, you might be better off just doing that as an, as, as, as an ADU. Um, so that would be the case there. But under the proposal that the city staff has put forward, there's a 60-40 split on floor area of the development. So in other words, rather than having one really big house and one small house on a large lot, you'd have to split that 60-40. And in the examples, it kind of shows that you get a larger house and, and, a, and, and a small house that way so that you don't have just big, big single family houses. Okay, that's helpful. I, I think my, my point, I don't think we have to talk about this a whole lot more, but I think my point to staff is, is to investigate how to mitigate the sort of worst case scenario, which is there are four people living on a lot and you go through all of this simply so that four people can live in something bigger, seems like a bad outcome. Um, and if we could avoid it in some way, that would be great while still encouraging this type of development that could have more people living in that lot, which is the, I think the point. So that's one point on that. Right. Um, it through the chair, if I, yeah. if I can jump in and just sort of reiterate um, the point about the maximum lot, or sorry, maximum unit size. That's exactly what we were trying to, to get to, to try and avoid. Um, I do know what you're talking about where some attached ADUs do look like just an extension of the house, an additional bedroom um, that's 500 square feet, um, maybe not intended for any sort of, rental unit purposes. Um, as Arnold mentioned, we did put that maximum unit size requirement in there. Um, so somebody couldn't come in and just build a, a McMansion type of house. Um, 
um, in a ministerial fashion. They, they could through a use permit, but that would be subject to planning commission review. You could talk about the size of the house um, if you find it to be you know, potentially harmful to the health, safety, welfare, or whatever reason, um, could be grounds for denial. Um, so the, the really key point is that maximum unit size um, to get to the, to the bottom of you know, not having these McMansions, having two actual units that are smaller and more um, similarly sized. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, I, I, I think the spirit is you're trying to figure out what that balance is, and you're going to have to try to project out a whole lot of stuff about where to set that max in order to encourage development, but discourage that kind of um, outcome um, that we we're just talking about. So that would be one piece of feedback on that. Um, so on the parking, um, and I appreciate the Commissioner Barnes pulled up um, the, the exhibit um, and talked about the 5,000 square foot lot. And I know Commissioner Riggs has stated this. Um, I don't see why we shouldn't consider not having parking at all with these. Um, as long as we're not allowed to park on the street, which is the only real hassle um, that is um, the, the, from our community standpoint, the net public detriment on this, why exactly should we have a position about whether somebody's got a car or not, or parks it or not. Why can't we leave that up to the person who is deciding to split the lot and deciding what the use is and all of those reasons? Um, and ultimately you could end up having just two parking spaces or you could have three parking spaces or not four in that mix. So I would strongly consider a look at parking and really ask the hard question, why are we doing parking at all with these? What are we trying to prevent and as long as it doesn't end up leaking into a place we don't want it, why do we care? Because if you did that, and with the exhibit that we were talking about with Commissioner Barnes's comments, now all of a sudden that looks really cool. So there's not any parking there, that's all gone. Now we got a lovely front walkway and a couple front porches and people are right there in that community. Now you got front porches and front porches all over the place, you know, if you magically make storing the car disappear, that would look fantastic. Um, so I would strongly encourage that. I would definitely not do covered parking. I think you're headed in the right direction. And I would completely allow tandem parking. I don't understand why we don't do that all over the place. Um, that would limit a bunch of concrete that we're doing in our projects. So I think the parking is a place to really investigate flexibility here. It's also a decent incentive for folks because they don't have to build it. And it gives them more opportunity to utilize their lots in interesting ways. Um, and I, on the um, architectural design, I can appreciate Commissioner Riggs's point about experimentation, um, um, but I just, I see it the other direction. I don't think this is the place to experiment. Um, I think in fact, this is a place to encourage and not put those kinds of restrictions on. And from an equity standpoint, I don't think there's anything we should do that's gonna put more onerous architectural design or privacy or other things in place here in, um, on projects that we tend to approve anyway. Um, and then finally, on the daylight plane and the setback on the second floor, um, I think that one is to be thoughtful about. I do think um, as we are transitioning in this community over the next 20 to 30 years, um, that it is really shocking to end up having two stories that are just a matter of a couple feet away from the person next door. That ends up being a significant um, um, struggle between neighbors. Uh, and so that sort of four foot to 20 foot setback and how to think about the daylight plane, um, I think you're going to have to nuance that in the mix. Um, so those are my comments this evening. Commissioner Barnes, I have you next, but if you're okay, could I go to Commissioner Doe, who's not had a chance to speak yet and then come back to you? Would that be okay? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Let's go Commissioner Doe and then Commissioner Barnes. Um, thank you, Commissioner Barnes and Chair DeCarty for letting me <laughs> Go ahead. Um, in, in general, I would like to say I also agree with um, commissioner comments and, and uh, community member comments about not increasing restrictions. Um, and to add to your comment about parking, um, I agree that in those that example 1A and 1B, where you have parking 
as the front is rather alarming. But then when you also look at example 2A, if you move that parking to the back, it creates an equally, and also three, a alarmingly long driveway um, with uh, a lot of asphalt. Um, and I would, and for three B, the, the same, um, to have a parking access courtyard in the middle of four units, it seems like that is a perfect place for a people courtyard. Um, and in fact, I live on a street that looks very much like that. Instead of individual units though, each of those units would be a duplex and there's a shared parking access courtyard. Um, and what happens is during the day, everybody parks on the street so that the little kids can play in that courtyard. So just to echo your points about if spaces for cars could be turned for people, the interior courtyard, um, it's unfortunate that it's needed for car access. Um, I think that is all I have for now. Thank you, Commissioner Doe. Commissioner Barnes? Thank you for, uh, I appreciate that um, uh, deferring Commissioner Barnes, over to you. Well, it was easy. Commissioner Doe usually has much more insightful comments than I do. So I was pleased to hear what she had to say. Um, so I had a moment to collect my thoughts after my apoplectic response, which I'm no less apoplectic on, but I have a couple um, questions, to, some, some uh, points or questions to make along the way. Uh, question, well, point of clarification, thank you. So point of clarification on the lot coverage. Um, lot coverage is not simply a function of how much is taken up. It's what it's utilized for and what's the opportunities to aggregate uh, parts of the lot which are open uh, to some benefit. And the example of a single family home with an ADU on it, represents the ability to master, to, to design by one entity around uh, a space, around a lot efficiently. When you get a situation where you've got, say, less lot coverage, but on a rental property with multiple units and, and it ends up being all hardscaped because you're trying to provide four types of amenities. You're taking the same amenity, the same patio space, in replicating that um, pavers four times, you now run into a situation where you're not efficiently using that space. So uh, the, the, the ability to cohesively landscape and provide green space on a unit that has slightly, has more, has let loss cut, less lot coverage, but more space, but is not coordinated across one, uh, but has to provide amenities across four units, I think is a fundamentally different thing. And I think it's um, not uh, helpful for achieving any type of um, landscape or greenscape, uh, you know, in addition to saving any heritage trees, for goodness sake. Uh, the, so I just, that's my thinking on that. Um, my question to staff is, you know, the premise going back again to the opening slides and how SB9 is um, not only looking at the production of housing, but looking at increasing home ownership opportunities. Uh, are there mechanisms available to Menlo Park to uh, tip or incentivize home ownership versus lease or rental of these properties? Um, given that that's one of the state's objectives and are there levers to be pulled to push in that direction? So question to staff. Is, is your question um, like geared towards SB9 development specifically or in, in the city more generally, are there incentives to provide ownership opportunities? For example, if somebody um, like in an R2 or R3 um, 
built a duplex rather than than condo subdivision separate housing units is, is that the question so more generally as a municipality uh, as a municipality reacting <clears throat> to uh, a state bill either levers that are available to this municipality that are either economic incentives zoning incentives um, ways to incentivize when the production of housing happens that a unit would be uh, for sale versus for rent and are there any levers to be pulled at the local level for that uh, should that be for instance a priority for any reason got it um That may be a question I'm, I may pull in our, our acting principal planner or sorry acting planning manager Kyle Parada, um, but generally it's more of a, a market. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if we have incentives, you know, for rental units versus market or for sale units. Um, I may need to look into that and get back to you. Thank or you. Or look to um, Kyle. Is. Is, is Mr. Prado on this evening? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, through the chair, if I can um, jump in here, I'll, I'll try to provide a little bit more um, uh, kind of context here, but I think uh, Chris's answer generally is correct. Um, the city at a local level, there isn't a policy um, from the city's housing or planning divisions regarding kind of home ownership versus rental properties. Uh, I think what you're asking about is probably like uh, needs some broader policy discussion, community outreach, you know, and direction from um, kind of the council level of if staff was to look at incentives for home ownership versus rental properties or looking at what potential barriers are in place. I mean, I think just uh, kind of as anecdotally, like um, when you go from, let's say there's four apartment units on any of these SB9 projects to four condo units, condos, subdivisions require um, the rec in lieu fee through the Quimbiac. It's, it is a, a pretty large number per unit. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I feel like it's in the $74,000 per unit range. So there are things like that where the, the community and, and through the council can, can direct staff to look at kind of what those kind of costs for um, subdivisions and for sale projects are compared to rental projects. And we could we could certainly evaluate that. We would need more direction from the council though, but that's probably outside of the SB9 ordinance that we're working on right now, where we're really looking at how can we at this local level implement uh, the state law um, and, and take into um, through this study session tonight, the commission's um, input and guidance so we can draft an ordinance to bring back. Uh, that's really geared toward imp towards implementing the law because at, at this point we do not have a uh, a local ordinance. So we the state ordinance is currently in effect in Menlo Park. Does that provide a little more context? It does. Basically, it says not a purview tonight, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think I appreciate that point of view, but everything is everything's political, right? And and um, you know. Uh, I'm a strong advocate for home ownership, and this is so. Uh, yes, so you're. Thank you, Mr. Prada. You're, you're. I understand your point of view from staff perspective. So through the chair, your point's well taken, and I think uh, we'll, we'll certainly keep that in mind. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely look into uh, that comment with the overall context of SB9 and our, our city attorney's office. We'll, we'll absolutely take a look at it. Yes, and 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 look, if something like this were to gain steam, it would be outside of the context of this. You know, it was more of a fact finding and educational component because you know what what levers can be pulled, and you guys being the the, the experts on staff provide me some information so I can start my my noggin working on this. So I appreciate that. Um, but I don't. But I I guess I in closing I don't believe it's outside the purview of this because the first slide said that the objective of SB nine was to encourage home ownership and we're weighing in on SB nine. So for that reason, I think it's I think it's in the fair way. Um, uh, so through the chair, actually, if I could just um, to uh, address that real sure. quick, and um, I, 
so so the the as a local ordinance there, there could potentially through the lot split be a prohibition on condominiumizing the two units that get developed on the new two lots so i think to, to commissioner barnes's point there there is definitely um some potential here where uh, a certain commission or a certain community could decide that the units need to be rental units and you could potentially restrict the condominiumizing of the two new units on each lot split. Um, the, the state law does not say you have to allow for subdivision. And, and <laughs> Chris can correct me if I'm wrong though, because I, I should, I should, Chris is the expert in our planning division on, on SB9, but, but I believe that is one thing in terms of creating homeownership opportunities. We're not looking to restrict, or we haven't, sorry, I should, I should back up. The professional staff is not recommending at this time any restrictions on um, condo subdivisions of those two two new units on each separate lot. You, from the state, you have to create two lots. You have to be you have to allow a, a homeowner to create two lots. Though those two lots could then have two units. You could look at restrictions. And I'll turn to Chris to make sure I didn't misspeak here. No, that that sounds correct. Um, at a minimum, the SB nine, the urban lot split, is just the subdivision of the land into two separate lots. Um, like Kyle said, there is no uh, requirement to allow the condominium, condominiumization of the two units. Um, so we could, as a city, um, decide to restrict or allow them. Thank you. Um, and I apologize, I haven't read SB9, so allow me a, a clarifying question. So the ability to split a lot does not have a minimum lot size is that correct it, it, it does um so the state mandates 1200 square feet as a minimum lot size unless a city adopts a smaller lot size um however there is that 60 40 um lot split um if you will um but yeah there are minimum lot size requirements Thank you, you did say that. Okay, I, I, I was just surprised at how small it was. Um, and I will uh, weigh in my thinking about uh, design standards are, they are very helpful. Um, if you walk over to Palo Alto and you walk into Palo Alto's planning department, yeah, they'll tell you exactly what the design standards are. Um, and it, it makes it, when you've got a situation where you've got use permits ostensibly because uh, on these you know less than 7,000 square foot lots, 5,000 square foot lots, you're, you're close enough that you wanna have folks like us have discretionary approval on it. If, you, if you're gonna, if we're gonna contemplate as a community, even you know, 4X, the tightness of building um, and structures next to each other, four feet setbacks to the side, it's entirely reasonable. As a matter of fact, it's entirely preferable that there are design standards. And design standard, it's a, it's a, it's a misnomer, you know, if not a canard, that a design standard makes it more complicated, more restrictive, and economically unfeasible. In fact, that's not that, that may not be the case at all. What it does is it streamlines the process, sets up a sets up a guidelines for what folks can do, and minimizes neighbors yelling at each other uh, over over issues of what it should be. So it's 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 not a correct reading to look at design standards as being either pejorative or restrictive. What it I think that the way to look at it is it provides efficiency and a path and minimizes disputes when you're looking at putting folks this much closer to each other. So I am a big proponent of design standards and um, I think they serve a, a a meaningful, helpful purpose to the community. And I don't think it's true that they put economic hardships on folks. Um, uh, so those are, I'm sorry, those are my points uh, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. We'll go to Commissioner Riggs. I will just note we're about 20 minutes away from 11. We'll have to have um, uh, a vote whether we'd want to continue past 11. We'll see if we need to get there or not. Um, Commissioner Riggs. Thank you. Um, 
I wanted to uh, respond to uh, a comment about uh, <clears throat> that uh, sample layout A5. Um, I have to say, I actually thought that was great site planning. Um, and it actually is reminiscent of projects that we've seen here at the commission on uh, allied art streets like Partridge. There were got to be four or five of, of these. Um, before that, they were fairly common on Hoover. Um, there were also a couple of developments done quite a few years ago off Valparaiso. I think one is on a street named, uh, um, <clears throat> oh, I don't remember, something pretentious like Chateau. Um, and the result is that you get uh, a paved courtyard with nothing happening 99% of the time. Um, and as suggested earlier, if uh, uh, since you'll notice that um, uh, in this sample layout, the parking is not um, in the courtyard. It's uh, these spaces P1, P2, P3, P4, which presumably are carports <clears throat> um, or may not be covered at all. So uh, during the daytime, this would be absolutely communal space, play space. Um, uh, third Sunday of September, uh, barbecue space. Um, uh, what, uh, and it leaves a lot of space that is green space and has no cars parked in front at all. So this is a fantastic layout, um, even though I'm not thrilled with the idea of four units on a um, R1E lot. So I also wanted to, um, uh, comment on design standards. Uh, one to echo Mr. Barnes that actually standards are quite helpful. They're helpful for neighbors, but they're also helpful for anyone who's going to go build because you know what is acceptable. This is part of the reason we've been hoping for design standards citywide for the, the whatever it is, 18 years that I've been on the commission. Uh, and from time to time, I have a council member come and say, Henry, you're an architect, or can't you help us with design standards? But it's, you know, it's a, it's more than a 10 hour project. It's a huge project. Um, and um, although some neighboring cities have accomplished it, um, and they need not be cost oriented, um, uh, we don't say no stucco, we just say smooth finish stucco. Um, uh, deciding where the windowsill heights should be is not a cost issue. Um, uh, so the design standards can be very helpful and I do not think that they um, harm uh, being able to build a unit. They protect everyone involved, including the possibly the next owner of the property um, who will get a more thoughtful space simply because it's not in the county or Redwood City or someplace where um, perhaps not currently, but um, in the past pretty much anything goes because it doesn't seem that important. Um, so uh, again, I'm quite supportive of what has been done here. Right. Thank you. All right. Turn uh, with no hands raised to Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, are you getting the type of feedback that you wanted from this study session? Is there anything outstanding for you that you would like to hear something about before we, looks like we um, may be closing? Through the chair, I may. Um, it sounds like um, our um, contract architect, Arnold, would like to say something about sure. design standards. Oh, thanks. I just wanted to check in again. I think one of the things I heard was a complicating issue is, is the parking. And I think what I'm hearing is that, uh, and I want to check on with you to see if that's accurate, what I think I'm hearing, is that the parking 
in the front yard or paving a lot of front yard space is, is quite problematic in, 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 in terms of how it might affect the, the community. I'm also hearing that uh, it may not be that the commission uh, would want to require one car per unit and would and may not be that they would want to require tandem parking and the parking especially the tandem parking makes site development quite tricky and and, and difficult especially on on the small lots so any more information that you can provide us there as to what your direction is it seems like you would prefer at least from a requirement point of view not to overdo it on the parking but to maybe emphasize uh, open area and, and landscape over parking. That's a question to the full commission. Um, at 15 minutes to the hour, I'm a little leery of opening up for all commissioners. Um, what I would try to summarize back to you is that you're not gonna have unanimity from the commissioners on um, how to solve the problem that you've identified. Um, I think some commissioners would be happy to have much less parking. I think other commissioners would wanna have different sets of solutions to be thought about in that mix. So I don't think you're gonna get unanimity. With that, unfortunate effort to try to summarize i completely don't want to shut off commissioners from um stating their point of view in this mix so i will turn to commissioner barnes and then commissioner doe thank you so yes uh absolutely the the idea of having four uh paved spaces in front of these you know in example 1a is just an awful awful uh, idea. What I would like to hear, though, is um, your thoughts on, uh, for 1A, where, if there were, because I, I want to utilize uh, the project manager that we have, you know, that we have you here, if, so scenario one is, if there were to be four spaces on this lot in example 1a and they weren't lined up in front and paved where could they go i'd love to i'd love to hear your thinking on that um, and start with that and then work backwards from that to yeah reduce parking requirements um okay so i'll try to answer the question quickly because i know you're under a time crunch uh it's very difficult especially with the tandem parking uh, once you start putting the driveway down 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 the side of the lot it takes up a lot of space you, there's no way to sort of turn cars and have a backup in, in in this in this situation if you had a shared driveway for the two lots and the shared driveway could be anywhere on the two lots it might be make it a little bit easier to make that work but because the lots are small, the, the driveway and the parking and the backing up become really con con constraining features. So in this case, there's probably a scenario where it could be feasible with tandem parking. Without tandem parking and requiring two spaces, then you get into issues of the units won't work and you'd be forced under, under state law to try to make other compromises. So the way the state law works, I think, is that if the standards the city puts in place are not feasible, then, then you have to give relief to those standards to allow these, these two units of, of each 800, 800 square feet minimum. So it, it would come into a, a, a situation where the applicant would come and say, I can't make this work with your standards. You have to give me some sort of relief. And I think that's the position that we, we would be in. The diagrams were created not because they're all good, but to say, okay, this is um, meeting the projected standards. Could you build on this lot? And what are the possible ways people would be likely to build? And I guess it's I guess it's fair to say with a 50 foot width. Um, so with that, 
unless the parking requirements get reduced, there's, there's no other place to put it on a 5,000 square foot lot, right? 50 across. So, um, so, so with that in mind, uh, absolutely, you're going to hear from me reduction in parking because, you know, there's no other place to put them. We, we, we can't stack them along the side with a 50 feet across um, lot. So, yes, reduce. Yeah. Let's figure out how it is to reduce spaces. Um, and, and also the tandem parking issue would tandem. make a difference. And, and and I'm sorry. So when you say tandem, you would say, for instance, move P2 in front of P1 in a sense, and then reorganize how a unit one's laid out. Is it right. the version of tandem? You could theoretically put a driveway down the side and put P1 and, and P2 in tandem, one behind the other. Yeah. Uh, outside of the outside of the front yard or partially out, outside of the, the front yard. But the only mm -hmm. catch there is you might have two different families living in two different units, and the parking would be in, right. in tandem that, that that that's why i think that staff was thinking not to allow uh um tandem parking because you had two different families agreed agreed I, I, from a practical standpoint i think that's not good okay so i'll leave with this um something something's got to give but, but this isn't it and uh 100 reduce support reduction in parking thank you Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Doe, you had your hand up and then took it down. I just want to make sure you had that. You're okay. All right, Commissioner Thomas. Yeah, so it seems like the, the parking is going to be a sensitive issue. And in the future, that we might want to give neighbors the opportunity to chime in. Um, and so, thinking in this manner, I'm starting to think that maybe a requirement to limit one curb cut per project could be good because it could force any egregious um, parking situations to you know have to go for approval which will give you know neighbors who I think that are the parties that would be most concerned an opportunity to fight against this that's all So we are close to the top of the hour. Mr. Turner, can you say what happens next in this process? We've had this session tonight. What, what happens next and when will this get finalized? And I, we heard from several folks in letters um, and I, I particularly appreciated uh, Patty Fry's letter asking uh, about the opportunity for people to know more in advance, have an opportunity to know where they can have their voice heard. So if, as you explain the next steps, if you could also um, help people know where they could provide input if they couldn't this evening. Right, so um, this was obviously a study session, um, no votes or anything we're being taken tonight. Um, next steps, uh, we would take your feedback um, go back to the drawing board a little bit, we, we will eventually need to bring an ordinance, um, a fully drafted ordinance uh, with language with the requirements development standards um, to the planning commission um, for more discussion and a recommendation to the city council. Um, so at, at the meantime, I think it would be helpful if we had, I have a lot of, of notes um, <laughs> from, from the discussion tonight. Um, it may be helpful um, and I don't I don't want to a little bit of so I guess what I should say there were some conflicting views on on the planning commission and it's it's um, you know we'll have to take those into consideration um, when we draft the ordinance um, but certainly um, there is a, a web page about SB9 on our website um, if people want to check that out. Um, for the most part, it, it is just interim guidelines. Um, we could add some language about, um, you know, if they wanted to give additional comments, um, they could always email, um, call staff, and we can, we can talk through concerns. Um, but we would like to get a, an ordinance drafted and, and back to planning commission relatively soon. 
So just to play the next steps, the next steps are, of course, any member of the public, anybody can be in touch with you all directly with feedback uh, that you, the next step though, is actually comes back to planning commission. And at that point, it will be something that we are supposed to act on as a recommendation through to city council. And then the final step will be city council discussion and approval. Do I have that right? And you would like to have that happen sooner rather than later. Right. Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, this is a going once, going twice, gone. Uh, before I close, Commissioner Barnes, yes. You're on mute. Thanks. Um, help me to understand those sooner rather than later. What are the externalities that are pushing, what are the external timelines that are pushing this? What are we, what are we, what are we reacting to? Right. So um, SB9 is, is in effect. It's, it's been in effect since January. Um, and since we don't have an implementing ordinance, um, we're pretty much limited to what the state law says. Um, so we have no objective standards other than somebody can split their lot into two lots um, and build 1600 square feet up to two lots. Um, other than that, we have no other um, standards for people to, to work off of. Um, so as far as a, a externality, um, we are, there is some interest from the community. Um, one of the commissioners mentioned they heard We've had one, only one project up to this point, uh, which is true. Um, we've only had one SB9 lot split. They haven't come in with a development, but we are getting um, a lot of interest in, in wanting to understand what the standards are gonna be so people can potentially start coming in with, with further applica uh, more applications. Um, other than other than that, it's it's just a matter of us operating under the bare minimum state standards. I guess what I'll add is we can spend as much we can spend two or three meetings on grandma's on a, on a variance for grandma's garage because her overhang is out by six six inches. This is a <laughs> this is a fundamental transformative piece of this community, which, which is unrivaled by anything we will do um, now or in the future, if you look at the scope of what is possible here. So giving this the time it needs uh, is an absolute requirement. So I, for one, um, am not persuaded by, if we needed more time, you know, I, I know staff is overworked and underpaid, but if we needed more time, we probably should have started earlier. But that does not mean that this thing is jammed. Um, and I won't, that, I won't, that won't happen. Thank you. All right, any final comments? Okay, so, um, all right, uh, Commissioner Harris, I'm going to pause us because we're three minutes to the hour. It's my understanding that we actually are going to have to take a vote on continuing this because otherwise we need to stop right at 11 and I have to at least give a couple minutes to report to uh, informational items. So I need a motion in a second to continue us sometime past 11 o'clock. I would suggest that we say 11.10 and that we um, get done before then. But that's just my suggestion. But I need a, I need a motion in a second, and then we got to vote on this. Uh, Since I have my hand up, I can just yep. say, could we? I agree. I like that motion to eleven ten. All right, that's a first, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, I wanted to ask why we can't just go directly to final items and close the meeting. Uh, that was my effort, but I had one hand and we may have had another one and then we would have reached 11 o'clock. So it was my prerogative um, to actually try to do this the right way from my understanding of what our practice is. So that's why. 
All right, I'll second, although I would have gone for 11.05, but uh, I'll second the 11.10. All right, so a first and a second that we will be done at 11.10. Um, Commissioner Barnes? Let's beat that, yes. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Uh, Com uh, Vice Chair Harris? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. I'll vote yes, great. Okay, we can go to a maximum of 11.10. Commissioner Harris on the topic at hand, the floor is yours. I just had a couple of follow-up items as um, just following up on Commissioner Barnes and his concern that this is a really big change for our town and that we really should take the time. I think it is going to be a real challenge um, given that we are not going to agree. It's going to be hard to find something that we all agree on. Um, I had a couple things when you come back, just I'd love a couple answers. Um, one is, what is our expectation as to how many lot splits are we going to see um, in, in over time? Um, as I think about my own lot, in order for me to do this, I would have to tear down my house. And I would imagine that's probably true of, of many or most of our lots. I would like to get a sense for that. Like how many lots are 5,000 square feet? How many are less than? How many are 7,000? Just to get a sense for where, where are we going with this? Is this like, you know, 1%? Is it 10%? I just like to get a sense for that. Um, and then the other uh, answer that I haven't been able to get is, and this is because it's a county question, I think is, if I were, if we split our lots, does that reset the assessment for county, um, for the, for the property tax? Um, because I think that would also be an important um, question um, that would make people think twice about whether they're going to do it or not. And I couldn't get an answer to that. So those are just a couple of things. And then also the parking, like what is the likelihood that we're going to need, like what, like having a map that shows us, okay, these are the, I think per um, Commissioner Riggs, these are the areas where we um, are in a zone that where we wouldn't need to have parking. How big is that? Is that a large part of Menlo Park? Is it a small part of Menlo Park? I'd love to see a map for that. So those are just a couple of things that I think would help us all as we're trying to figure out how we could possibly get on the same page. Um, for these. So that's what I have. And that was one minute. Thank you. Sounds good. All right. So any last comments for Mr. Turner on the study session G1? All right. So I'm now going to close item G1. Um, and with just a a uh, significant thanks to staff and especially Mr. Turner. And I think Mr. Riggs made this point about two hours ago that it was an excellent staff report with a lot of information um, and th there's a lot to digest. So appreciate your ongoing work um, helping us and the community understand what's at stake and what the options are. Um, and with that, um, we now turn over to informational items. And so that puts us to Ms. Sandmeyer, I believe. I ask good evening again. Um, so the next planning commission meeting will be in three weeks. Um, so we haven't finalized the agenda, but it looks like we'll have um, three single family home use permits on that uh, agenda. And that concludes my announcements, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, uh, questions, uh, Vice Chair Harris? Yeah, my understanding is that we have submitted our housing element, HCD, and I was wondering if you could tell us um, what are the next steps? Will that be coming back to planning? What, what are the, quickly, what are the next steps on that? Thanks. Um, yes, I believe there will be um, planning commission review. I don't know the exact next steps. Um, I can follow up with the planners working on that and get back to you. Yeah, that would be terrific. Would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. Uh, do you have any update on um, anticipation on if and when we would go back to in-person planning commission meetings or when that will be decided? Um, no, I don't have information on that. I think it will just kind of depend how the pandemic goes and um, decisions that are made for how to proceed. So they're, they're, there are no set criteria for that. Is that just a decision made by the city manager or the city council? Who's, who's making that decision? And what kind of input would planning commissioners have into that before it's made? 
Well, I think the city council does vote on it regularly to continue um, remote meetings. I believe there's, um, it also has to do with the rules that the governor suspended at the beginning of the pandemic. So um, kind of emergency rules that could change kind of depending on what happens. Okay, uh, thank you. Commissioner Riggs. I just wanted to say briefly that I think if we all wanted to meet, we would, in person, we would have to say so. Uh, I think that would carry a lot of weight, but we would have to know that we wanted to do that as a group. All right. Thank you. Any other questions of Ms. Sandmeyer? All right, with that, I will close item H1 and move to the last item, which is to adjourn. Thank you all for hanging in there this evening. To staff, thank you for a very long evening and for all your work as always. Um, have a good two weeks. I hope everybody gets a chance to refresh the summer and we will see you all next time. Thank you, Mr. Evening. Chair, for running an excellent meeting. Thank you. Thank you everyone for letting me speak one more minute and thank you so much to staff. Thank you everyone. Good night.